All right, all right. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, joining in for our monthly meeting. It's the, our August meeting. The year is uh, eighth month. Wow, it's moving fast, right? Mm -hmm. No, everyone's like, no, Vinny, it's just you. All right, good. Well, <laughs> we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, Carol, will you do a roll call? Yes. Uh, Lorraine Koss? Here. Charles Venuto? Here. Vinny Toronto? Here. David Scherer? Here. John Windsor? Here. All right. uh, Terry Casto? Here. David Lane? Here. Stephanie Ely? Uh, she may attend via Zoom. Uh, Kimberly Newton? Courtney Barker? I think she's on her way. Todd Swingle? Susan Hodgers? Here. Um, and let's see. Laura Lee Thompson has asked to be excused. I'm trying to figure out if we have a quorum. We don't have the in-person quorum until Courtney Barker or Todd get, arrives. Um, what other lane is oh. absent? Because that's finance. We should be. That's finance. We should be able to miss two lanes and still be. But we can't vote on anything unless we have the five in person. There's seven lanes, right? Right, but we need five here. Right, and so finance is one lane. What other lane are we missing both of? Education, I think. Okay. Yeah. Kimberly and. Um, Kimberly and, and Stephanie. And Stephanie. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I can get up and do a song or dance or something uh, <laughs> to delay it. No, I'm joking. Um, okay. Well, let's see here. Um, why don't we? Um, I know uh, Courtney said she will be here. Um, she's running a tad bit late. Um, and so, why don't we go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance? Um, and then uh, we'll do it slowly. <laughs> And, uh, and see if we can get some other attendance. So let's go ahead and do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. While we wait for someone else to roll in, I'm sure they will, let's just uh, go over... Uh, Again, we're going to do another hybrid meeting. Uh, as you all are speaking, please make sure that your mics are on, um, so that way everyone can hear you. Uh, for those in the uh, public remotely, um, our bylaws uh, guide us to take public comment only on motions. So after every motion, and those in the crowd as well, um, after every motion, I will ask um, if there is public comment, for those that are remote, if you can raise your hand, um, not physically, we can't see it, but raise your hand in the Zoom um, and we'll go ahead and call on you. Uh, there also is a public comment at the end of the meeting and I will uh, at that moment uh, take a public comment and call on you. Also, John and Terry, um, uh, go ahead and test the raise your hand uh, button so uh, we can make sure that both John and Terry can be recognized. I know Dr. Windsor's looking. You'll find it, Dr. Windsor. It's there, I promise. There it is, there it is. Okay, and uh, Terry, will you go ahead and raise your hand? Hold on, Terry's finding it. He's got it. You're hot, you're cold, so cold, freezing, warmer, warmer. No, I don't know where your mouse is. There it is, found it. All right, great, good stuff. Okay, all right, so with those ground rules set, um, through, and through the magic of television, Stephanie is here, <laughs> yay. No, you're good, Stephanie, no worries. So, Carol, now we have a quorum? Yes, we do. Woo -hoo! All right, so uh, the first thing on the agenda will be, uh, let's have a motion, or look for a motion for acceptance of virtual votes. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Any public comment? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Um, all right, we will go next to the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, <laughs> another second. Any discussion? Any public comment? 
All right, we'll go ahead and vote on that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. All right, <laughs> two of unanimous votes. We're doing great, everybody, we are. All right, then third, let's go for three in a row. Approval of the minutes. Uh, I'll look for a motion to approve the minutes. I'll, I'll move to approve the minutes. All right. <laughs> Second. Oh, <laughs> it's like a tennis match here. Like the ball's going back and forth like this. I love it, all right. Any discussion? Any public comment? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the minutes are approved. Let's go now into the progress and fiscal report section, our monthly progress report from Terry, which by the way, Virginia is not here for those that uh, haven't looked up yet and seen Terry. <laughs> uh, and so she is, I think she's taking her child to college. And so uh, hopefully that went well. Um, it's always awesome to uh, see the beginning of somebody's uh, uh, adult career. So uh, Terry, welcome. Thank you. All right, good morning. Um, for the progress this month for work completed, we finished all of the smoke testing for the 30,000 homes in the three test areas. The homeowner grants have been coming in, um, or sorry, the code enforcement letters, some of the code enforcement letters have been sent out and we're getting phone calls from those homeowners. The Sykes Creek phase one uh, muck dredging project, the dredge material management area, completed its construction and they actually started dredging last Friday for that project. Um, these septic upgrades, we had four more reimbursements processed. We now have 83 complete and 213 contracts executed with the homeowners. The UCF um, completed their 24 month monitoring for their oyster projects and found an average of 63 oysters per bag with both growth and new recruits. Um, one derelict vessel was removed from the lagoon, and we had a plethora of contracts executed. Um, two for West Melbourne septic to sewer projects, Titusville Sandpoint Park Baffle Box, and the Sykes Creek M&T septic to sewer vacuum design contract was executed. And we have one video completed, the McNabb Oyster Prism. We'll be seeing that later this today. Two video, oh, or, yeah, okay, that says one. <laughs> Um, the Save Our Indian River Lagoon 2023 application portal is now open through September 30th, so we will be getting uh, new project applications in. Um, South Central Sea Septic to Sewer is under construction, about 40% complete. Uh, when this was produced, we had 135 of 147 homeowner connection uh, grants contracted. That number is now up to 139. Uh, the Miko Septic to Sewer uh, project is upsizing its force main to accommodate uh, Miko B project being connected to that one as well. South Beach is O. Uh, the contracting is in progress for that project to get going. Um, South Beach is P is prepping for bid. The survey and design is going on for the other 13 septic to sewer projects. The plumbing services RFQ is currently in review um, on the county side with risk legal and purchasing. The Scottsmore C and I projects are currently under construction. Those are up north. The um, next three stormwater projects are in different phases of um, design and engineering and uh, getting the right of way. The Basin 1390. 1398 sand dollar vegetation harvesting is set to start in the fall, so we're working on that with the consultant. Uh, Basin 71 Flounder Creek project is, um, they're updating the plans to include some BAM, the biosorption activated media. And see, um, Grand Canal is removed an additional 17,500 cubic yards of material, so we're up to two, over 210 cubic yards. Um, the Brevard Zoo Restore Our Shores con constru um, construction's underway for the Oyster Bar at Castaway Cove. Um, let's see, video progress. We did smoke testing and the fertilizer videos. We're waiting final edits on those. And then we had a couple other contracts that are um, in almost executed, the Lori Lane project for Satellite Beach and the Rockledge Equalization Basin project. That one actually, I just got back, so that one's executed now. And then um, working on this Satellite Beach Hedgecock Grabowski fields and the Cocoa Beach Phase 3, um, or sorry, Phase 2B Muck Amendment. 
And then we are also currently working on providing the documents for the 2022 audit. So some of our upcoming presentations, um, last month Brandon presented at the Beachfly Ocean Legacy Fest. And then September 24th, we'll be doing the Rotary Back to Nature uh, event. And then in October, the Merritt Island Wildlife Association. Um, we have our forums and volunteer opportunities. And then uh, it was previously mentioned for information about the at-risk vessel and derelict vessel program. So um, FWC is currently uh, revising their protocols and they have agreed to come present next month on that program. So awesome. that is it. And then um, we wanted to talk about um, some of the events currently happening in the lagoon. So Matt's going to give a brief history and overview of what's going on. But there have been um, a couple of fish die-offs throughout the lagoon, and um, this is our seasonal high water temperature time of year. And so Matt's going to show some of the chlorophyll levels, our water temperature data, just to put everything into perspective. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good she morning. Share it. Make sure you share that, too. Oh. It is a Zoom. Did you share the screen? I didn't. Wait, hold on. There, make it there. All right. Thank you. Okay, good morning. So there's been some talk of some recent algae blooms and some fish kills in parts of the lagoon. So we just wanted to show you some of the data that we've got. Uh, and show uh, our harmful algal bloom online viewer, which is uh, some imagery derived from our, our remote sensing satellite project. Uh, so here's a look at just some of the most recent, pretty recent chlorophyll values. The top part of this red square is from August 10th, uh, so about nine, nine days ago. And you can see the average chlorophyll from these sites from a one-day uh, reading from the St. John's River Water Management continuous monitoring stations. The averages are looking at between 20 and 35, the highest being 35, which is up in uh, Rockledge, Cocoa area in the IRL. Uh, so, you know, average 20 to 30. Uh, and then uh, just a few days ago, August 14th, you know, your highest readings in the lagoon, again, in that cocoa area, 20, 27 and a half, uh, and down to, you know, 5 to 10 uh, in some other parts of the lagoon. So, you, you know, your average chlorophylls are around there. And in, to compare that to some HAB history in the past, uh, you know, decade, we're looking at, from, in 2015, we had that big super bloom. You're looking at uh, chlorophyll measurements as high as 130, uh, averages from, in the other parts of the lagoon, above 40, 50, 60. Uh, again, in the, during 2017 to 2019, we had a pretty prolonged period of blooms, or you had chlorophyll levels in the Banana River, you know, 80, 50, 60. In other parts of the lagoon, you know, hitting peaks of 40 or so. And then in uh, 2020, we had a pretty prolonged bloom in the summer into the spring. Chlorophyll value still 40, 50, up to 100. So just to put that in perspective of, you know, the bloom that's going on now and, and it's pretty spotty is, uh, you know, it's a, these blooms come and go uh, throughout the lagoon and throughout the year. Um, here's a look at water temperature throughout the lagoon. This is um, just the, from July through August. This is all of the St. John's River Water Management continuous monitoring stations in the, uh, in the lagoon and Banana River and Mosquito Lagoon. You see temperatures as high as 33 uh, a couple weeks ago. So that's 33 degrees Celsius. That's up to like, you know, 90 degrees, 90 plus degrees Fahrenheit. And that's in open water in the middle of the lagoon. That's pretty high. Um, so that's another reason we could be seeing some blooms, you know, right now. And if you look at this chart, this is pretty interesting. This is a graph of uh, 
the Cocoa Rockledge area in the middle of the IRL from 2018 to 22. Each year is a different color, and then this spans uh, a one-year period. So this is from uh, 2019 to 2022. Each each year is a different color, and we can see the peak of peak water temperature is seems to be like mid-August, end of July, mid-August every single year, and it seems like this week um, is a peak kind of almost every year, this week and, and this middle of August time period. So that's pretty interesting, and that we're starting to see blooms now that the water quality or the water temperature is really peaking up. Um, take a look at our uh, online uh, HAB viewer here. And um, no, I did not. Yeah. So we're going to exit out of this real quick. Can you get to that from the SOAR web page, Matt? Uh, can you go? Can you just go that route so that we have it? Uh, can, Brandon, can, can you just, yeah. just walk through? Just that way people at home that don't have the link yeah. or the QR code can see how to get there. Because I don't right. know about you guys, but late at night I sit there and I look at this half thing. It's yep. amazing. So if you don't know where the SOAR web page is, if you don't know where the SOAR web page is, you go to the Brevard yeah, County page. All right. Thanks, Logan. All right. So if you go to brevardfl.gov, that's the Brevard County website, and you see the picture of the manatee, click on Save Our Indian River Lagoon, and then you'll come down here to the maps section. And they were just added in. We're, we haven't got the pictures in yet, but we do have the links. So down to the algae bloom mapping reports, there's an algae bloom viewer tool. And you can also subscribe to emails where you can get updates by email on when we have new reports. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. And this is the online viewer for this uh, remote sensing data. And this is from the Sentinel-2 and 3 satellites. Uh, to use this, uh, you're going to come down here and choose the satellite. We're going to look at uh, Sentinel-2 cl uh, chlorophyll viewer. And we'll open that up. And the reason for the different satellites is, Matt, can you just... uh, The different satellites each cover a different area of the lagoon. The Sentinel-2 seems to have a better uh, coverage spatially. Like I tell my little brother, the first one is always better than the second one. <laughs> Sentinel-2 was before Sentinel-3. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're going to compare two images and slide back and forth between them to see the difference in time uh, for chlorophyll in the lagoon. So on one side, we'll look at, you know, for a few before it really temperatures kind of heated up. Good. Uh, June, time of June. And then we'll look at, uh, look at the most recent one. Those hamsters, they're running in that cage, man. They're yeah. trying. <laughs> there it is. We're like crashing the server because mm -hmm. everyone online is trying this right now. <laughs> So here's a comparison between a couple dates. Uh, this is the, on the left hand, we have uh, July 4th. And you can see some areas of some blooms 
popping up in the lagoon. When we could slide over to August, we see blooms in different areas. They kind of move around, they pop up, they go away. Um, and the blooms are the bright red area, the right? Blo yeah, the blooms are the bright red and yellow out in, out in uh, open water. So you can look, here's one from June 24th. We had, you know, pretty clear water, not a lot of chlorophyll out there. These uh, yellow, bright yellow areas are sandbars where we may have calerpa or seagrass growing. Then we can scroll over here to August. We see these blooms really pop up, possibly due to the increase in water temperature. Uh, and you, we kind of see that a lot in the IRL. So, yeah, it's a pretty cool tool. Check it out. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. And uh, I, before we do, because I think we're up to the finances, right, Terry? Are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm finished with the monthly progress okay, report. Okay, great. Um, I just, t two things, if there's any other, actually, any other questions from the progress report, David? I had a question on the, um, uh, the sex project. Mm -hmm. Microphone. Oh, you're Mike. Mike. That's a joint project with state dredging and soil funds. Is that correct or no? I believe anybody, so. Anybody answer that? Do you know? I think it, there are state funds involved with it. Um, I don't know what percentage off the top of my head. I was wondering, maybe you can't answer it, but dredge funds, typically they only, you know, they only dredge to a certain depth for navigational purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, soil funds are designed to, you know, get all the muck out they can in a given area. So I wasn't sure Maybe you guys can explain to me how is the decision made on how much muck to remove out of a channel or a canal or somewhere, given there's two different protocols. The, the way it's um, working now and the permits are working now, this is to remove muck only, not other sediments out of the bottom. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers my question or not. <laughs> so it's uh, environmental dredging versus the Navigation. navigational dredging. So when we're doing it for the environmental purposes, we're allowed to bring it down, the muck down to the sand yep. layer. Uh, whereas the navigational dredging only allows a certain depth below the mean high water just for navigational purposes, which usually doesn't get you to the sand level. So that's where the difference is. So because the permitting's with the environmental dredging, we're allowed to bring it all the way down to the sand. So we're taking out more muck than dredging, than, than navigational. navigational dredging alone. Correct. That answers my question. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other, David? Uh, I guess maybe this is for you, Matt. Uh, is there anything that jumps out? I mean, I, I look at the lagoon every day in my backyard and see around this time high temperatures. You get lots of bloom type effects going on. Um, cocoa was brought up as being the place that's, that's currently having one of these bloom issues. Is there something that's um, obvious about the cocoa area that makes that region? I mean, we look at, you know, is it, is it sewage leaks? Is it. Um, you know, is there a reason why that uh, flows residence time of the water in that area? Is there something that makes cocoa a region that is bloom um, prevalent for this? Uh, so it's hard to tell just by looking at this map. Uh, you know, this just shows that it's the, you could look at the water quality parameters and say, hey, you know, this is high. Or you could look at some of the sampling results, you know, for nutrients. We didn't pull any of that up, but St. John's does have that. So you could look at that and say, Yes, nutrients are higher. Yes, some, something's higher here, but uh, I would just be speculating about certain infrastructure problems or anything like that. Have we tried correlating these blooms when they occur with water quality, temperature, nutrient maps, that kind of thing, like causation type of So analysis? that's, uh, yeah, good question. That's one of the reasons why we took on this project was that it could be a tool to kind of pinpoint, you know, where we could do some uh, you know, mitigation for different things. You know, is it occurring in areas that are surrounded by septic or is it occurring in canals or areas where there's muck or is it improving, is the water quality improving in areas where there's already been mitigation? So uh, kind of uh, developing. Uh, and we have submitted uh, for grant funding to do this for a second year. So after maybe doing this for a year, figuring out what we're seeing and, you know, how we can, you know, process this data, the next year going forward, we could be able to maybe use it to answer those questions better. 
is that being tied in with the gentleman we had to speak that's doing residence time modeling with the FEA, where he's looking at how long water dwells in an area? Because realizing that water doesn't change over for you know up to a year or more in some of these locations is like a definitely a sort of smoking gun thing to look at as well. You know, for why I would think. Yeah, it'd be really cool to overlay that mapping that data with this for sure. All right. Any other questions or comments in the progress report? All right, I just had uh, two. First off, I think from Matt's presentation and um, some of the things that I've seen um, is that uh, one of the facts we know is that the hotter water means that it holds less oxygen. And so we're definitely seeing those spotted fish kills. Um, one of the things that David, and David mentioned to me too before the meeting, he's received a lot of um, pictures of seagrass from fishermen around the lagoon. And I know I personally have as well. Um, and that's not to say that the lagoon is fixed. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying and what I think I've seen um, being on this committee uh, for six years is that the work that is being done is, is trying to stop system-wide um, events. And I think this is an example of that. Obviously, we still have areas. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, but I think the lagoon has gotten better to a point where there are spots that it's better. And my, my hope is that more and more spots will be better, meaning that events that do happen, out of, because of things we can't control, we can't control the water temperature, um, that, um, that it'll stop it from being a system-wide event, giving it a chance to recover. Um, so I, I, I just think it's amazing the work that we all have done and the county have done. You all have done a great job. So I think this is, this is a sign of that. So thank you for that. Um, another thing too, the smoke testing is complete. Um, and I know I got a smoke testing thing. I know it was, it was a funny thing. I, I had a friend who had a smoke testing placard and he's like, what is this? And so I told him all about it and he was excited. So I think that's another project, another thing that we did that wasn't in the original project plan that we added on, um, which I think ended up being a good, a good thing. So um, the last thing, and I know I said two and I'm, I'm taking three, um, but some of you may have received an email from Missy Weiss, and I just wanted to plug this. This is a day in the life of the Indian River Lagoon. Um, those of you who may remember, Missy came and talked to us, I don't know, it was a while ago. Dr. Windsor, you're the one that did the uh, sheet that has all the, uh, the presentations. Do you, do you remember off the top of your head when Missy came and talked, and talked to us? That was a couple years ago. Yeah, a couple years ago, Lorraine. I do not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, but, uh, but anyway, she is doing, again, a day in the life of, of Indian River Lagoon, um, and I think she's working with ORCA. So, Missy, thank you for keeping that going. Anyone who is interested, it's October 6th. If you're interested, please reach out to Missy at M Weiss. That's M-W-E-I-S-S -S at teamorca.org. Um, and so uh, that, that's, again, for those that don't know, that is working with our um, students, grades 5 through 12, um, to teach them about the lagoon. So I think that's a, a cool thing. Start them young. All right, anyways, we'll go ahead and go to the next item on the agenda, which is the fiscal reports from Crystal. Fiscal from Crystal. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so here is our summary table. I did this one. Did everyone get this one? Okay, so this, this will get sent out. Thank you. Um, so currently we are at uh, this current month of May. Um, as a revenue, we received 4.2 million. For this year, we're at 40.6 million. And then I'll get to the cumulative at the graph. And our current expenditures uh, are at 14.6 million. As you can see, it continues to grow. Let me scroll down. And um, our cumulative expenditures are at 48.9 million. All 
All right, so this is our most updated graph, as you can see here for our revenue. We're at 267.4 million um, in overalls. How do you all like the new format? Looks good. Do I have any hands raised? All right. And then next we will be going to our quarterly expenditures. And Crystal, just for the video's sake, the differences in the graphs were, could you All sum right, it up? the just differences in the graph is, um, as you can see, you just see the last three years um, per the COC's request um, instead of every single year. So when you see right here um, the bottom line showing um, beginning of year BOY at 126.1 million, that is cumulative to start at that point and still continue to grow. So it does not negate any of the others. You still see the whole thing. You just aren't seeing every year by line. Great, thank you. All right, so we have our quarter three expenditures um, per project and type. Did anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay, I think we're good. Can you see hands raised? Is there a hand raised? Let me see. I don't oh. see any hand raised. All right. We're good. All right. That is fabulous. Sorry, scrolling through. All right. Following this, we will have our grant page. Try not to make everybody dizzy. <laughs> So this has been separated by the type of grants, and this shows you their expenditures. The change in this is that um, since zero, year zero through two, um, fiscal year 2017 through 2019, there were all zero actuals. We just condensed it and made it one column because there's nothing to show there. Great. And as I go through them, this is all I've got for y'all. Do I have any questions? Doesn't look like any questions. All Crystal right. knocked it out of the park. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, here you go. Okay. Um, I'm going to start the quarterly progress report. Um, as you can see through the performance table, there's uh, highlights of yellow, and that just rep represents anything that's changed from the previous quarter. So, But I made a PowerPoint, so let me get that going. Okay, so this is the quarterly progress report for quarter three, um, April 1st through June 30th. And we have our wastewater treatment facility upgrades. The Melbourne Grant Street Water Reclamation Facility has completed their engineering. Um, they, uh, it was the formal project design and everything was approved by their um, city council in June, and they are expected to go to bid next quarter. The Osprey uh, facility up in Titusville is 57% complete with construction. They completed their 30-day settlement period um, successfully and um, installed their handrails, diffusers, and um, other important parts. <laughs> the West Melbourne Ray Bullard facility is, um, has completed 45% engineering, and they are currently working on 60% designs. And the Rockledge facility was, um, the contract was recently executed 
and that one should be moving forward rather quickly too for construction. Anthony's going to touch on the sewer lateral since we've made some progress on that. Great. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. So the smoke testing uh, work is complete as far as uh, work in the field. Um, utilities is working through the um, reports and providing um, notices to the homeowners of their deficiencies and also um, informing them that um, the Sabre Lagoon program has a grant to help them with these costs. Um, so we're already getting plenty of phone calls um, and uh, working through those uh, those needs. So um, we had a, we put this little video in here for y'all so you see there's, um, there'll be another video coming in the near future. Um, Whoa, look at that. So but this is an example of what's being seen um, and coming out of the ground and you know in broken clean out caps coming out of the ground and through the grass because some laterals broken. Um, Brandon and I went out and we saw it coming out of gutters. Someone had hooked up their gutters. So there's a lot of um, deficiencies were found. Or actions that really shouldn't be. You should never hook your gutter to your clean out. No. Nope. That's just a bad thing. And un unless this is done. It's a bad thing. Not really caught. So, yeah. So please don't do that. So the other uh, major progress we're making is on the South Central Zone C septic sewer project. So we're um, at 47% complete um, and uh, as of uh, the end of July. And um, we have, so this is, there's three subdivisions in this um, project area and they're working um, one by one through it. So they've almost wrapped up the one of the subdivisions. It's um, paved. There's waiting on FPNL to finish um, powering the lift station, and they'll be able to um, start connecting people or allowing connections um, in the next, you know, two months. It, you know, it, we're not quite sure when they're going to close that out because we're on FPNL's uh, timeline. Um, they have moved us up their timeline, but we're mm -hmm. still on their timeline. And that's power for the lift station, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, they've. For the, um, the second subdivision in there, they finished putting the lines, uh, the sewer lines in. Um, they're uh, doing, they, again, we're waiting on FPNL to power up that lift station. Um, and they're basically tidying up the area and they're going to pave and um, that'll be um, complete shortly. The, um, in the final subdivision, they're just breaking ground there. So um, that'll probably. The construction will go through December there, and the whole project as a whole will be um, um, expected to be finalized um, January 8th. So, um, so we'll get our DEP close out, utilities close out, and we'll have one done on the books. And so and this is, oh, please, Lorraine. I'm just going to ask specifically, where is that located? This is um, the Indian River Isles neighborhood in uh, unincorporated Rockledge. Okay. And so this is a force main. Right? Nope. Oh. This is a gravity sewer. Gravity sewer. Um, there's a force main that then connects those list stations to the existing um, South Central service area in uh, Suntry. But, um, and so yeah. that means because it's gravity, the county has an ordinance that says that people have to hook up to, so, the, to the sewer line. So the homeowners have already received their warning letter from utilities, or it's a notice letter saying um, this 365-day uh, notice will be coming shortly. And then as soon as we get the FDEP and utilities close out, meaning like it's fully inspected, it's running properly, um, and then that 365-day notice will go out to the homeowners. And for those that don't know, that means that if, if you have a gravity main near your house or to your house, you have to connect to it within a year. That county ordinance has been in place for maybe 20 years. Yeah, it's been it's, a while. And it's based on the state ordinance. It mirrors the state ordinance, yeah. um, and the county does enforce it. Um, there have been situations where it wasn't enforced in the past. Maybe there wasn't capacity at the plant, um, but then they'll go back and um, send letters once capacity is available. Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you, Anthony. All right. This is uh, table seven and eight in the performance chart um, showing our uh, 
septic upgrades and quick connects. I think we had a total of um, six more quick connects completed this quarter and 13 septic upgrades. Uh, this is Basin 89, the Scottsmore Arancha Road project. Um, this one uh, recently went under construction. They are, are clearing the land. Let me see if I have, oh, here's my mouse. So they're going to install, this is looking west and the lagoon is over this way. Um, they're going to install a baffle box in this area and then, then um, the water is going to flow through the BAM material and then flow back out this way towards the lagoon. The City of Melbourne Grant Place Baffle Box is currently 80% complete. Um, here's a picture of the box being installed. And after this presentation, Danny ha from Melbourne has a few um, photos to show of some archaeological finds that they uh, discovered during the, this project. Dinosaurs? Close. Oh, <laughs> no. Um, Melbourne Tillman Water Control District started their vegetation harvesting project on the C21 canal. So these blue lines are a lot of their canals um, that they're going to be doing with this project. They focused on C21 from April through June. They removed over 200,000 pounds of um, vegetation and that had an estimated total nitrogen removal of over 2,000 pounds. And then here's some before and after photos of that canal. And this canal is in, within the county, correct? Yes, yes. And this it's, is using the harvester that you all purchased? Or? Yeah. Well, I don't, they've bought pieces okay. so far with the money. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, for our muck removal projects, the Canaveral South um, project uh, completed their initial field surveys, so soon we'll have the footprint for that area. The Grand Canal project is still underway. Um, they've removed 210,500 cubic yards of material. And the Sykes Creek project, as I mentioned, started dredging last Friday. Um, the DMMA area is complete and um, that is underway as we speak. The oyster projects, um, the Brevard Zoo started with their Banana River contract and installed um, 2,638 square feet in the Banana River this past quarter. And then Cocoa Beach um, has gotten started on their um, project as well. This project includes uh, three different types of oyster projects. They've got the Gabions, the prisms and something called Rhizolith Islands, so the, it'll kind of be featured in the video that we're going to show later. But this is some photos of them getting installed. And then along with the Oyster Project, they're doing a, a planted shoreline project. And these are their mangrove planters that they installed. And then right here, you can see the oyster prisms in the water as well. So an overview, um, we removed an Ex, um, extra 3,500 pounds of nitrogen this past quarter, um, executed another uh, nine contracts, and a couple more projects got underway. So do we have any questions about anything? Awesome. David. Uh, on the Canaveral South dredge project that you said was uh, under contract. Oh. Under contract. Does anybody know how far, I don't even know the name of that body of water, but it's the northernmost canal, the, the big one there. It's probably part of that project. Um, it's on this one. Yeah, the one that's just south of the, uh, the water treatment facility. Here, this one. How far east the, the plan, the, the dredge plan goes? I don't think we have that yet because oh. of the, we need to, the initial field surveys were just done, so that'll okay. be the next step. All right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Charles and then Terry does have his hand up. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. and then Susan. Yeah, just kind of remind me, Terry, the uh, residue from the mechanical harvesting, where do they take that? They have a property off site that they're taking it, so they have, depending on what's most economical for them, they're either taking it to the dump or to a site further west, away from the canal. It's So from those pictures, you can see that the, sorry, I passed it. The canals have already been cleaned up along the edges where they are pulling the material. Okay. Okay, Terry, and then um, Susan. Yeah, uh, Anthony. 
uh, your name came up um, in a call that I got from a citizen, Coco, Coco citizen north of uh, 5, uh, 520, that River Road, uh, Indian River Drive, or whatever it is, pushing back the residents apparently are not buying into getting off their uh, their septic systems onto what I understand was planned to be a forced main. Can you um, give us any status on that? So that was planned to be a gravity sewer project. Um, there were, um, the community had put um, a couple of meetings together to discuss this project. There was a mix of um, support and hesitation um, because of some of the unknowns that happened with all the sewer projects where, you know, homeowners aren't sure how much this is going to cost them, if anything. Um, and then the, um, you know, would you want to, Lauren, would you want to speak? Well, I just or? say the estimates for the for the work, mm -hmm. including the homeowners portion of it, were even with aggressively pursuing grants, were coming in at less than a million short. Mm -hmm. And cool. so there was uh, the council voted two to two. I was recused, and um, that's where it stands. And they are still. You know, I think they have sent a letter here and still looking for other avenues of funding. Since um, the idea of the cost, first of all, the cost on 92 homeowners would not be fair. Mm -hmm. um, there'd be resistance to that. But the city being one of the poor cities in Brevard, um, was resistant to adding that expense to taxpayers. Yeah. So there was some. So it's still up in the air. Yeah. So there was, there was no real hard, um, like opposition to the project, mm -hmm. um, and people, people just they want their concerns um, answered prior to buying into the project. And I think from the staff perspective, it's uh, seen as being a very difficult project because of that terrain, mm -hmm. um, the boring needed, and um, also the, the size of the lots, um, the age. Some of those homes go back more than 100 years. And um, just actually getting to the septics is difficult. Um, Sadly, uh, many of those homes are actually built into the bluff, really do not have drain fields. So, um, so still searching for the solution. Yes. Terry, did that answer your question? I'm going to let Susan in. Uh, Lorraine, you mentioned your million dollars short. I mean, if you had, if somebody wrote you a check for a million dollars, does that mean the project would go forward? It sounds like I Terry's think they might get three votes. Sounds that like they need one more vote on council, and I think that if the money were all there, and of course those are all high estimates, so if the money were all there, I think they would go forward. But I, that's just based on the comments made. Okay. And I think I think this is one of the harsh realities about what we're doing. I think everyone knows septic tanks. We need to try to get those off the lagoon. It's all about the logistics, um, and making sure that that we can do this the best we can. And there are burdens, um, and it's trying to uh, remediate those the mo mm -hmm. the best we can. Um, so uh, as long as as long as people are still talking, it's still going. That's, that's how I feel. All right, Susan. I just had a question for Terry on um, for clarification on table eleven. Um, the Grand Canal project, uh -huh. we had talked earlier about, is it uh, considered navigational or environmental? Environmental. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then on the first, when you talked about the progress report, you had mentioned on the cubic yards to date was 210,500. Mm -hmm. And then on the table 11, it says 99,210. Is that the predicted or actual nitrogen removal? Oh, that's estimated. House. Those estimated. are all estimated. All, all those numbers are. Um, and then the last question, I know last meeting we had talked about the project. 
I think they said it was going to be the February 2023 to complete. For or, Grand Canal? Mm -hmm. Or do we I know? I think it's a later in 2023, right? Yeah. And they had talked about that the there was some problems with the subcontractors, um, with gator dredging and the subcontractors. I know there's something going on in the courts right now with the right. previous subcontractor. The contractor now, there's no issues. So there is pending litigation between the county and gator dredging and the subcontractors? Not with the county. It's okay. The county's not involved in that lawsuit. Okay. And then the lawsuit. Yeah, it wasn't What's related to any of our projects. Mm -hmm. So okay. it was a previous dealing that the subcontractor had with Gator that we had nothing to do with before okay. they were even doing our project. Okay, so it's within the Gator and the subcontractors, Correct. not with the county. Right. Correct. Okay, thanks. All right. And, and, and again, just because I know that I had a clarification, a question, a clarification of this. Gator is the contractor working on the dredging. For they, Grand Canal. They, for Grand Canal. Mm -hmm. They are getting a subcontract. They are getting a contractor themselves, a subcontractor, to deal with the interstitial water. Um, and there were some issues. Um, there have been three subcontractors, but I think the current one now is meeting the marks, the target. And if they don't meet the target, then they don't get paid. So that means even if they fall a little bit under the target, all the work that they did, they don't get paid for it. So, uh, but I think the current subcontract they have now is doing a good job and things are all um, going swimmingly, pun intended. <laughs> Courtney. Oh, I was just gonna ask, um, Lorraine, if you all have thought about maybe submitting a legislative prior, you know, request for the money to finish that project off? Uh, no, I don't think that's been considered, but that would, that's a good suggestion. I would strongly recommend doing that, particularly with you know, Leader Mayfield being in the position she's in, and mm -hmm. um, all of our legislative delegation has been very successful in bringing back funding to Brevard County for lagoon-related projects. So um, I would think about that. And then... Um, and that would be in addition to the FDP yeah. dollars that we'd be applying for. Yes. And, and just, you know, spelling out the challenges, because I understand where that area is. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think that people who live near the water in the city of Coco are wealthy. That is not true. Most of them are air properties, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are historic properties. Having worked in Titusville trying to do septic to sewer conversions way back when, when we were using, like, CDBG funds and stuff like that, yeah. just the added sewer bill was a concern. Yeah. Because it's, you know, that population, it's the difference between groceries and paying your sewer bill. So it's a big concern with that, and I, and I totally understand it, um, but that area is such a priority given its location and the age of the infrastructure. So um, I, I think you have a really good case for doing that, and if you all need any help with filling those forms out, just let me know. Okay, great. Thank you. Susan, yeah. So when you said, like, the $18 million for the Grand Canal project, that the three subcontractors they weren't paid any money so that won't we won't be penalized for that money well they were i think it's broken down on a, either a daily or weekly that they meet their target so I, I don't think the entire 18 million wasn't was not spent because they weren't meeting the target there may be portions of it and that will come back and usually what happens is, is virginia when we go to our project plans updates in november virginia will see if there's any additional monies that we have left over from projects that were completed under budget and then that money will then get looked at at how we can use. Do you know how much was the three subcontractors were paid? I, I don't off the top of my head. Um, how would we find that out? You could just ask Virginia. Okay. When she gets back, I'm sure she could look. But I know the project isn't completed. No. It's so ongoing. and so and so, I'm not sure. Um, the county probably has a delay in when they get reimbursed. Okay. Um, so I think that's something that we can um, ask Virginia to look at for November. Susan, because I think it's a good idea to see what okay. dollars weren't spent, especially as we get later into this project plan. The money that we have <laughs> available to add additional projects is probably going to get smaller and smaller. Right. So that's a great pot to look at to see if we can use. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Terry, I know I saw you stop sharing your screen and everything. Oh. Will you just bring up that um, mangrove? Um, the mangrove planting project. And I wish Laura Lee was here because she talked, maybe it was three meetings ago, about how hardened uh, the Titusville shoreline is. And I just saw that picture, and I thought that was really cool um, because even if you have a, um, you know, a, a seawall or a hardened shoreline, uh, I think it's pretty cool at the ingenuity that they came up to hang little hangers off the end of your hardened um, wall. 
And I know there's mangroves. Some people don't like to put mangroves up. Um, but I'd imagine that there's all sorts of vegetation, Florida native vegetation, that you could put in a planter box like that. Uh, oh, I got my Sunnyland people giving me thumbs up in the audience. I like it. Um, but I think that's really cool um, because I do think things like that are going to help us get back to, to where we need to be. So that, that's awesome. Terry, thank you for showing that. And, 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 and for the updates, too, the pictures. I love pictures. This was a good, good, uh, good quarterly update. Thank you. I can send you that, David, if you want. Yeah, where, where, where <laughs> is that? Do we know exactly where? The project location? Well, where that exact seawall is. Yes, this is at McNabb Park okay. in Cocoa Beach. But is it on only on one side? It's really easy to find? Yeah. yeah. You can't miss it. Okay. Awesome. And it's in progress. Construct, there'll be additional very innovative planting designs. Do you have a mic? Yeah. No, no, you're, so, so it's in progress, and there'll be additional planting designs. Other type of plantings outside the box, yet in the box. See, there you go, another <laughs> pun. All right, awesome. Sorry, I'll stop with my puns. Uh, like Dave, did you have a question? The oyster shell, just to clarify, that looks like a stainless box with oyster shells. On the left. And then mangroves in the oyster shells. That's pretty yeah. cool. Kelsey, <laughs> come on, you can't come to these meetings and get away. Usually when Danny's here, we're pulling her up. This is a project for you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Kelsey Mack with the City of Cocoa Beach. Um, these are our vegetation planter boxes. So here you see them, they have mangroves in them. We also plan to plant Spartina in a different section. So the section that we've already completed is 36 feet long. There's about 48 mangroves in there, super awesome. Um, but basically what this is, is it's a wooden frame. We just, we bought all these materials at like a local home improvement store. And the intent here is, you know, we're testing out this idea, seeing if this is going to be something that our residents can implement that's low cost along their seawalls. So it's basically made out of wood. It's wrapped up in the same wire mesh that they used to build the gabions, filled with oyster shell, lined with a um, concrete coated jute material, which is the same material that the oyster prisms are made out of. And then we filled it with coquina shell, some coconut fiber, and planted the mangroves in there. And so far, they're doing pretty well, and they've been in the water for about a month and a half. Man, it's yes. like an Indian River Lagoon smoothie. <laughs> quick question, uh, quick question on that. At maturity, what is the pl what are we supposed to be looking at? Maturity? Yeah. Of the plants? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So as you can imagine, along the seawall, um, some residents, you know, still want to maintain the waterfront view. So our plan is to maintain them at six feet, and that will extend about two and a half feet above the seawall. So we'll maintain the view, but also um, provide those water quality benefits as well. Thank you. So you can have both. Yes. A view and be uh, uh, planting uh, mangroves. Sure Good can. stuff. Thank you, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. Kelsey. Oh. Are those root systems projected to grow out of the bottom of that containment area, or is it going to stay held in there? Um, so the containment area that they're in, it's made out of like the same material that the prisms are made out of, which is supposed to break down over time once the mangroves get established, so hopefully you know those roots grow up and out, and same thing with the Spartina, hoping to hold in that material. So we don't know, you know, how many years they're going to perform in the way that they are now, um, but this is a good location to try it out. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, my understanding was that, Sorry. Uh, that I've heard at points was that um, the canals and such are supposed to, from a navigation perspective, they intentionally keep them clear. Is this going to confine them in such a way that that won't be an issue? I'm assuming it would. Okay. Um, so these one box that you see being dropped in with the crane is about four feet wide by two and a half feet wide. So, you know, it's the same or it's it takes up less space than a resident's dock. Um, so it would be something that would be allowed and would not block navigation. Great. All right, Eric, good question. Okay. Terry, I'm, I think we're bringing Danny in now, right? Yes. <laughs> For our... Uh, well, one our, thing we want to oh. point out, too, though, it does take permits to do these. You can't just go put them in yourself, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but if you talk to uh, Cocoa Beach, they'll <laughs> help you talk through the process of getting those permits, I'm sure. So reach out to Kelsey or whoever your uh, who are, city... Who are the permits through? Who are the permits through? Brandon? Um, so to do this, uh, the mangrove planter box is the city had to obtain permits through DEP 
and Army Corps. Um, as far as residential canals are concerned, um, some type of city permit would be required as well, I believe. Yes. So I think the answer is to reach out to your municipality, whether you're city or county, and uh, find the process to do that. If you're so inclined. All right, awesome. Danny, show us pictures of dinosaur bones. Come on, let's see what we got. Uh, I, I wish I wish they were dinosaur bones. <laughs> so does my nephew. So down at Grant Place, it's um, an older section of Melbourne. Um, part of this neighborhood was platted back in the early 1800s. And so the boxes that was going in, we were in a fairly tight constraint because we've got our wastewater um, lift station on one side and property, real property on the other side. So we're out there digging and we start digging and we hit this really hard thing and they keep digging and they keep digging and they keep digging. And they ended up with this old manhole that was in place um, that we feel like was part of the original septic system that was installed in downtown Melbourne way back in the day. Um, well before any of us were around back in the day. Um, the picture on um, with the ladder in it shows that concrete wall there and that wall um, is part of the septic tank that was in the downtown area. So it's all been abandoned properly. We put in a new pump station down there in, the, in late 2009 and um, changed it from a, a reverse set, a, a siphon section, a pipe that siphoned it across the lagoon or creek over to our great place. Grant Street uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, so it's all been abandoned properly, but we had no idea it was there. So when our contractor goes to dig a big hole to put a baffle box in, these are the things that we find in places occasionally. And we just thought that this, you guys are always interested in pictures, and so we thought this might be something you might want to see. Yeah, that is that is really cool. Um, so that that was an early septic tank. Thank you, Brandon. So that, that's an early septic tank that was put in the, in downtown Melbourne, right, Danny? Yeah, Do that, that's what we feel like it is. It's, it's been there. It's abandoned. We were gonna. We had discussions about trying to remove the wall, and we decided that it was way more effort than we had the dollar for to remove the tank. But it's full of sand and debris on the backside, so it's not like it's discharging anything now. But yeah, it was part of the septic system that was installed in the heyday of downtown Melbourne. Awesome. Do we, do, we, do we have an idea around, like 30s, 20s? I don't. I don't, I don't have any history that far back. Um, all the staff that I've talked to, they're like, we had no idea it was there. That, that's how far back we go with our history. And we've got some staff that have worked for the city for over 30 years, and they had no clue that it was there. Yeah, good staff there. Uh, Lorraine, did you have a question? 50s or 60s, yeah. That looks cool. Thank you for sharing that with us, Danny. But you never know what you're going to find when you go open up holes. <laughs> that, that is true. That is true. You never know what you're going to find when you start digging. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Terry and Anthony, um, Crystal, Kelsey, Danny, uh, little Bobby Joe, little Johnny Bob. And everybody else. That was good. All right. Um, so the next thing we have is um, the other reports and special presentations. Oh, so the progress and fiscal reports. I did just want to say one thing else, too. Um, for those of you, you may not see a familiar face that you used to see. Um, uh, Walker uh, is uh, moved on to greener pastures. He found a, another job. And so I just wanted to personally thank him. Um, for those of us that have been on this committee since the beginning, we've seen Walker go through the bearded phase, the <laughs> non-bearded phase. He's still in the non-bearded phase, but as somebody who was bearded and non-bearded and bearded throughout parts of their life, it'll come back. It always does. Matt, right? Am I right? You've had yours gone. Now it's back. So anyways, um, thank you, uh, Walker, for all your uh, hard work um, over the past, gosh, six years now. Um, so that's really good. And uh, I know for myself, I, I wish you the best um, in going forward. Um, and I know you're still working on the lagoon um, in your own way. So that's cool, man. Thank you very much for your hard work. All right. Brandon. Uh, actually, it's not going to be me. Yeah, I was just 
you figured you had something to say, you were by nope. there by the podium. All right, so we'll go to the uh, other reports and special presentations. Our first um, presentation is Green Infrastructure, What, Why, and Where by Chris Bogdan um, from the National Business Development Manager, who is the National Business Development Manager uh, for Ferguson Waterworks. Uh, Chris? Thanks, Vinny. And hello, everyone. I am uh, th thankful to be here. Just make sure I stay over here. I got to be in this mic, and I'm kind of tall. Um, thankful to be here and talk about green infrastructure today and talk about kind of what it is, why we need it, and where we can use it. It is. Um, no? Yeah, it's sharing here. Oh, no, it is. Okay. Wasn't showing at the top. Yeah, so thank you. No worries. Um, so this will be pretty quick. It's a really fast overview and uh, hopefully just gives you a general understanding of what green infrastructure is. So I always like to start off by letting folks know who I am. I'm just a guy that grew up in Florida my whole life and I really was always on water and have been on the water. I love being on the water. Um, thank you. This is the first opportunity I've had to stand in front of all of you. What you're doing is amazing to protect our water and really restore the water that I remember growing up as a kid. I grew up in Orlando and the parts of the lagoon were the closest part to my house. So it was free to come over here and hunt crabs and fish with my dad. And I just have so many good memories of doing that. And I still try and get on the water every chance I get. My dog comes with us. Um, unfortunately, we sold our boat, but guess what? We can still float around in the water. Uh, and noodles are my favorite floating device. They fit very nicely in a trunk in a car. And I'm always looking for better flotation devices to enjoy water. So if you think you know something better than a noodle, bring it. I would like to know. Um, unfortunately, water's changing. Nobody knows better than we do about this. Right, So uh, the nutrients and things that are getting into our waterways are contributing to a lot of really bad things. And uh, we got to do something about it. we got to do something different. Where does all this pollution come from? I know many of you know, but ultimately it comes from the rain that falls on the ground and picks up all kinds of pollutants along the way. And um, anything from bacteria, and nitrogen, phosphorus, pesticides, you, you imagine or think of it, and it's going to find its way into the lagoon because we use a bunch of pipes to capture all that water and throw it into that big water body. So what green infrastructure is is a little bit different. It says, look, on the left-hand side of the screen, this is traditional infrastructure. Get water into a drain, into a pipe, and into a pond or a receiving water body as quick as possible. On the right-hand side of the screen, this is green infrastructure. If you think about what it was like before anybody showed up, I like to say before we came and put up a parking lot, um, it was literally just the ground. And when it rained, the rain stayed where it landed. Maybe a little bit ran across and got into some water bodies, but for the most part, water stayed where it hit. So green infrastructure practices say, hey, let's capture the water on site, slow the flow of the water down, try and get it into the ground when we can. So some examples on the left-hand side of the screen, gray infrastructure. Everywhere you go, you're going to see this. Water into a pipe, into a pond. Pond is in the back of that building. On the right-hand side, this is green infrastructure. It doesn't look a whole lot different, but all these islands, all this green space, none of that is used to manage stormwater. On the right-hand side, all these areas here are being used to manage stormwater, and we get rid of this pond. BMP, best management practice, I call it a big muddy pond, right? And the thing about these, these ponds are they're in your community, they're in your neighborhood, they're at stores. If you look at these things, they don't just hold the water on your site. They actually let the water go into the Indian River Lagoon. So it's kind of like a first line of defense, or not just the lagoon, but other receiving water bodies, creeks, lakes, whatever. So just because there's a pond on your property, the water doesn't just stay there. It actually leaves over a certain period of time. So what we want to try and do is get rid of these ponds and get the water back into the ground. This is really important for a couple of different reasons. Number one, pipes. We built these pipes and put these pipes in the ground you know, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. They were built for a certain population. What's happening? <gasps> we're growing, right? Three times, four times, 10 times the amount of people were in these same places, but these pipes are supposed to do the same thing or work the same way. They don't work, folks. So what happens? Flooding happens in your community. You probably saw it. There was a big old rainstorm here yesterday, and I got a lot of pictures from folks going, flooding, flooding. Well, pipes are too small. And the other problem, the water bodies are full. I hate to admit it, but when I was a kid and I came over here, I'd crawl in these pipes, and I'd because there was cool stuff up in there. Well, guess what? Here's what they look like now. When you go up and down the coastline, this is what the pipes, so what I say is the bucket is full. We've put all these pipes into water bodies. They can't go anywhere anymore. So that bucket that we've always wanted to use forever and ever, it's full. It's either full of water 
or it's full of pollutants like the Indian River Lagoon, and we can't keep sending them there, right? So what do we do differently? Green infrastructure. I like to think of this as us creating a bunch of little pails, little places that we can put water along the way instead of relying on that conventional bucket that is totally full. Right? And there's a bunch of different ways to get that done, and I'll talk about some of those things, but this is really a different way of thinking. Parks, not pipes. This comes from a great friend of mine, uh, Jeffrey Huber. He wrote a really cool LID manual. If you want to learn about LID, Low Impact Development, University of Arkansas, Google that Low Impact Development manual. It's free. And um, it basically just says, look, this is a 17-home community that he built. No ponds, park in the middle, pervious pavement, different types of things that I'll talk about here. There wasn't a stick of pipe on this property yet it can still manage a 100-year flood, right? So it's a different way of thinking and a different way of designing infrastructure. This is really important to us as a municipality. It's important for a number of different reasons. Number one, it's going to mitigate flash flooding. Number two, when we put water back down into the ground, we actually help with sea level rise. Whether we want to believe that as a thing or not, I can't go into the pipes anymore, which is probably good for my nieces and nephews uh, that <laughs> we won't let them go in there. But um, So that's really important. Reduce nutrients. Folks, when we, put the nutri when we put the water into the ground and it doesn't get to the lagoon, that means we're not letting nutrients get to the lagoon, right? Um, and then I think we don't talk about it a lot, but those big muddy ponds, those BMPs, they don't generate any tax revenue. Guess what does? All the property that you can use and build stormwater management into the landscape, that increases revenue for municipalities. For developers, what matters? Honestly, it's on the right-hand side of this screen. Money, 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 money. And green infrastructure can absolutely reduce the size of ponds and give builders more usable land. You know, I have this conversation with folks all the time. Builders are going to build. It is going to happen. There is nothing that we can do to stop it. So let's talk and have a responsible conversation about better ways to manage stormwater rather than argue and fight about it, right? Let's embrace the development community and show them there's a better way to do it because we can help them accomplish their goals and still help us accomplish ours in clean and water. So there's challenges for green infrastructure, and I'd like to highlight some of those, right? Too expensive to build. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see pavers, really nice, pretty. On the right-hand side of the screen, pretty nice pavers, but these allow water to go through the surface. So there's really not much difference in cost when you think about technologies. Um, too expensive to maintain. Every single parking lot I go into, I see landscaped areas with big old walls built around them. Guess what? You still got to maintain those plants. You still got to weed those gardens. On the right-hand side of the screen, this is a rain garden in the city of Cocoa Beach. Water can actually get in there. It can infiltrate and get into the ground. Um, there's a little bit more maintenance associated with it, but at the end of the day, it's plants and mulch, folks. Too expensive to repair, this is my favorite. What happens when we want to do upgrades right now to our sewer system, or sorry, our stormwater systems? We take a pipe that we've just identified as either underwater or too small, we make it bigger. Well, guess what? It's still underwater, but we have to tear up the street. We've got to do all these different things to try and do something that is a Band-Aid, folks. On the right-hand side of the screen, green infrastructure, is, it's at the surface level. We can see it with our own eyes. When it needs to be fixed, it's probably weeding, or maybe it's changing out some, some BAM that I'm going to talk about here in a second. But at the end of the day, it's all right there in front of us. And then one thing that I don't know a lot about, but there's a lot of conversation going on about this, is differences in code. There's a lot of, of stormwater. Folks are changing stormwater codes. Awesome. But there's development codes and ordinances that don't allow for us to actually implement green infrastructure. So there's a lot of conversation about that happening right now at a municipal level. Take a real quick chance to plug an awesome conference that's coming up in October. Um, the Marine Resources Council is having a conference. They're going to show folks how to use this amazing tool that the DEP invested in to identify weaknesses in development code and city ordinances that are preventing green infrastructure from happening. Really important conversation and would encourage you to get involved in that. So let's look at different uh, uh, different strategies or technologies here. This is a rain garden. Down there in the middle, rain garden, typically just a place where we can store water and it can infiltrate back down into the ground. Um, and unfortunately, I missed one of my, one of my little, I had a, a cool little uh, demonstration of this. But at the end of the day, you can kind of see it here. When this thing fills up with water, Water goes into that overflow pipe, that overflow structure, and then it just goes downstream. So, you know, flooding water, this is built to collect a lot of water. Flooding can still happen, but at the end of the day, the water has somewhere to go and, and discharge when it does fill up with water. If we have one of these huge rain events that can't take on uh, the water that comes in there. And there's a bunch of different ways to get this done. We see them uh, in lower left-hand corner. Again, that's the city of Cocoa Beach. You can put these in in front of your home, capture water, don't let it go into the gutter system. There's really cool ways that we can put these in these green street projects, these linear green street projects. Um, so lots of examples of ways that you can implement these things to maintain them. 
like I said, it's really, let's keep them looking pretty and fresh. We can replace the plants, replace the mulch. Down here, you're kind of seeing a catastrophic event, which would mean uh, the, 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 the system isn't actually flowing water anymore. But guess what? We just dig it out and put some new dirt in there at the end of the day. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in another presentation. Um, and then there's pretreatment devices like this one right here that make it real simple. It's like a garbage can that collects all the stuff before it goes into the, into the rain garden. So lots of different ways to help maintain these things. These are called tree wells. So you'll see these walk down a downtown area and you're probably going to see trees buried in a big thing of concrete. Um, <laughs> it's like how are these things going to grow and live, right? But, and, and many of these systems actually don't take stormwater off the street. So there's some really cool technologies. They call these suspended pavement systems. Um, essentially, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, it's an open cell, um, unconfined area. This gives the tree roots places to grow. It gives the tree a big, healthy opportunity to live. And then it also manages stormwater. So stormwater that would be running down the curb into an inlet, into that body of water, this allows it to actually go into to the ground or potentially hang on to it and let go of it uh, at a slow rate to help with flooding. Permeable pavers, there's all kinds of different ways to, or uh, different technologies in this space too, but essentially a permeable paver is a paver that allows water to go down through the surface. So you think about asphalt or concrete, um, when water hits that, it's gonna, we're going to direct it somewhere. Typically, we're going to direct it to a drain, to a pipe, to a pond. This gives us the ability to hold on to that water and do some cool stuff with it. And there's all kinds of different ways to do this. Uh, there's other products that allow you to do like gravel, as you're seeing on the left-hand side, grass that have a structure underneath them. So you can actually drive on this stuff and it doesn't rut or, or ruin the grass and, and great areas. And then there's so many access roads. You see this here. Lots of different municipalities have access roads to service different infrastructure. Those could all be permeable or porous surfaces as well. And then last but not least, porous concrete. Um, you know, we, we have uh, these panels are really Really, really cool. Ooh, ooh. I did something real bad. <laughs> no such thing. You're still here, Chris. You're here. I am, yeah. Hang on. Thank you for your help. That's <laughs> great. Just hide behind, yeah. You just switch the screen next down. There you go. There you go. All right. I, I literally don't know what I hit. I could not recreate that. <laughs> Technology and I aren't the best of buds. Um, but these are porous concrete panels. Porous concrete means when the water hits this, again, it allows it to go down through the surface. Uh, again, I love my friends over at Cocoa Beach. This is an example of a pond that just won't go away. Old infrastructure, you've got this big standing body of water, and all of a sudden you put a couple of these panels in, and the water it allows it to go through the surface, so the water goes away. Lots of different ways to use these. Um, you can clean and maintain these things. Remember we talked about maintenance a little bit. Um, there's all kinds of different really cool equipment to vacuum these things out and make sure that they continue working. Um, and then one of my favorites, constructed wetlands. Uh, these are really cool, um, essentially ponds, but they do a bunch of different things. They basically create a flow path of water to let a lot of biological things happen with plant material and with uh, just settling in the water. And what I love about these systems are they're gorgeous, they attract wildlife, and we're turning them into amenities. So these are really cool places for folks to hang out, enjoy, and then, oh, by the way, there's all these other benefits for water quality. So um, it really kind of ties in to um, just the social benefit that can come from building these types of stormwater systems. Um, some practical example, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get some other cities to help me out with this, but City of Cocoa Beach, this is over in Convert Cove, if you're familiar with that. Um, it breaks my heart every time I see this picture with the color of that water, but Convert Cove is a community that basically is, suffers from what a lot of these older communities suffer from on the, on the coast. All the water is just being dumped into the lagoon. So in this picture, when it rains, all these houses flow water into the street. All that water goes down the street and ultimately ends up in the lagoon, here and here. So this project that we did was a green infrastructure project where we basically converted the end of the roadway, where all the water is going. We said, hey, if we can get some of this water and prevent it from going in the lagoon, we're going to be able to prevent nutrients from going into the lagoon. So this is what it looks like. They used, uh, on the, on the right-hand side, this is the permeable paver system that they use. So this is allowing water to go right down through the street. Folks can still drive on it. The garbage truck, trucks can still come. Um, you see a little crate system down here. This actually created a little reservoir, created more ability, more, more area for water to go into. So it gave us the ability to capture even more water. And then at the end of these roadways, before we discharge into the lagoon, a BAM material was used, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. And then that's a rain garden that you're seeing. So we're again trying to capture that water before it ultimately goes into the lagoon. So it definitely helped the community with local flooding here. We talked to some residents when we were out there taking some pictures and they said, man, yeah, the rain doesn't, the water doesn't stay up in the road like it used to. 
that's really cool. And the city is actually monitoring this, and they're finding that the, 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 uh, the BAM material is removing nitrogen and phosphorus from the water as well. So this is an amazing example of ways that we can use green infrastructure to protect the lagoon. Um, and ultimately, I ask everyone, say, how are we going to manage water in the future? Development is going to happen. This is up in Melbourne. On the right-hand side of the screen, this is what it looks like now. You think it's going to keep looking like that on the left? I can tell you it absolutely won't. To the west is where we're building, folks. Pay attention. So we have an opportunity to really change the way things are going. We can fix what we've currently done that's maybe not right, but we can also do things differently in the future. And I think it's really important because we talk about a triple bottom line. Essentially, urban green infrastructure design brings together social impacts. I talked about maybe having amenities and places for people to be. Economic impacts, we're seeing a lot of downtown revitalization using green infrastructure, businesses are thriving and growing, and ultimately what matters the most to me is the environment. We can still remember the environment through this process, and green infrastructure gives us the ability to do that. I thank you for your time. There's me and my wife enjoying water um, in, in the Keys, actually. So uh, questions, I think, um, Virginia said, if anyone has questions. Yeah, Chris, thank you very much. Um, anybody have questions for Chris? Oh, yes, Eric, please, and then Courtney. Um, can, do you have any way of quantifying the like, difference in runoff with your de um, development efforts as compared to our current ways of doing things? Yeah, so um, some, sometimes yes and no. I mean, we can quantify volume reductions um, through monitoring and things of that nature. Nothing that I have showed you today or that I have that I could directly say, hey, when we implemented this project, this is the volume of water that we're reducing. Um, that typically gets modeled during the engineering process. So like for that project, somewhere around 50 pounds of nitrogen per year are estimated to be removed or prevented from going into the lagoon from that project. That was all done through modeling. So we can model to tell what's going to happen, and then there are ways we can measure it. But I don't have any of that direct on these projects. Courtney. I, I just had a question about your company. Is, are you, do you all do the design and the build, or are you just the, are you the builders? Like, how does it Yeah, so Ferguson Waterworks, I, we are product people. We're product experts. We're stormwater okay. distribution company, so we sell all kinds of different stormwater products. Okay. We work with municipalities to help them kind of understand where green infrastructure could be implemented. Okay. And then we work directly with engineers all throughout the communities, whether that be at the municipal level or with private companies um, to assist them in how big does this unit need to be or how, you know, how, how much water can we process through it. So we assist through those processes, um, and that's what we do at Ferguson. Okay, great. Thank you. David? Uh, Ferguson, what's it called? Waterworks, Ferguson Ferguson's Waterworks, yes, sir. With Ferguson Supply? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, as we start to go around and tell municipalities and folks all about what we do, they say, why are you here to talk to me about toilets and uh, <laughs> lighting fixtures? So we are the same company, uh, parent company, but we, the Waterworks division does everything with water, erosion control. If you can think about it from a stormwater management plant or perspective, we do that. We also work with wastewater treatment plants, so we do design build stuff for that. Pipe valves, fittings, that's our core business. Uh, about a year ago, year and a half now, we recognized green infrastructure is going to be a thing, and we started a whole new division that's solely focused on managing water through those principles and practices, and that's the group I work with. Are your, are the products that you've referenced, um, are the products that you've referenced in this uh, presentation commercially available to, uh, to uh, a homeowner or commercial property, can they, can they purchase that Ferguson supply or yeah. how, how might that work? Absolutely, yeah. At my house, I'm getting ready to redo some stuff and we're going to put in a nice, beautiful, permeable driveway. You have connections, though. I got connections, <laughs> but even if you don't have connections, you can, you can call me on the phone and I'll, uh, I, can give you, I can tell you where you can get it and how you can put it in if it's small enough. Um, okay. And even if it's not a product we sell, like putting in a rain garden. That's got nothing to do with Ferguson Waterworks. It has everything to do with just putting a depression storage in front of your house and directing water to it so you don't let it go out into the street. So there are a bunch of different products. I say we're really where we come in with products is when you can't do the traditional thing that's just kind of generic. We fit into some tighter spaces and have some nifty things that can do that. But yes, anyone can come and buy this stuff. Okay. And my contact information's here. I'd be happy to help okay. you with some, some ideas. Yeah, I'll probably reach out to you. I have two more questions. Um, what is the absorption rate of your porous pavers and your porous concrete, how much rain can they absorb given a typical site plan with the, you know, the gradients that are there, one inch and 10 feet or whatever it might be, how much rain can they absorb before you have runoff? 
So um, my least favorite answer, and put my uh, attorney hat on, that's why I say it's my least favorite answer, it depends. I hate that answer. I wish it could just be black or white. The reality of it is it depends on the product you use. Uh, for pavers, for instance, some pavers infiltrate water at 100 inches an hour. Some pavers infiltrate water at 1,000 inches an hour. Um, the porous concrete panels I showed you, those are guaranteed to infiltrate water at 250 inches an hour. So the product depends on what it is, and then that would really be dependent on how big of an area we put on the surface, because that'll dictate how much water we can get off the road in a, in a certain period of time. Um, and then it would dictate, you know, where are we at? How fast do you really need to remove water from your site? So there's a bunch of different options in that space. I would say the fastest I've seen is 3,000 inches an hour uh, through a paver system. Yeah, the numbers yeah. you're throwing out seem like they would collect yeah. any rainfall. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't get hundreds of inches an hour, it just doesn't happen. Right, yeah, no, it would it would do that, yes. Okay. I mean, we, we can build, you can build anything you want to build, then it comes down to money, but yeah, sure, you, sure. we could build systems to manage any rain event that we wanted to, provided that we had enough space to get it done. Okay, and then my final question, um, you had mentioned modeling, and I didn't really follow that question uh, at the very beginning, but <clears throat> did you say you guys have done modeling on, on the, the difference uh, between a stormwater collection pond and uh, a green infrastructure replacement in terms of the, the groundwater flow, uh, maybe to, some, in our case, like the lagoon. You've done modeling like that already? Yeah. So uh, the question that I was asked earlier, just to clarify and, and so you understand, is um, have we looked at the volume of water that some of these practices have prevented from going into the lagoon or maybe going into a municipal collection system, whatever that may be? Um, so to, to and the modeling component of that is engineers, uh, design engineers use programs that they put in all the information about the site. How much impervious area is there? When a one inch rainfall event, event happens, how much water does that create? And that tells them, okay, if I just created 100,000 gallons of water and the rules of the state of Florida say I've got to keep all 100,000 gallons on my property for 30 days, mm -hmm. then they determine how big of a pond they need to build or right. how big of a, a, a technology they need to build. So the modeling software is really things they use to design their projects. And the outputs of those would say, this, tree, this, this uh, stormwater facility that you built will manage a volume of water that meets a, a certain amount of rainfall. So that's when I talk about modeling, really it's, um, and, th and then that data is then submitted to a permitting agency, whether it be the water management district or a city, to say, hey, here's my proposed design. I'm showing you that with this much rainfall, we're going to manage the appropriate amount of water that the state or the city or county have deemed that we need to manage. And then the regulatory people would review that and say, yep, we agree that this design, in theory, is going to do that, and we go forward. So that's what the modeling component of that is, and that's all done by engineers when they're designing specific stormwater projects. I was going to maybe add, a, you know, I see commercial opportunity there for you and something on the, as a committee here we could recognize if you can demonstrate or a developer can demonstrate, you know, that a stormwater pond being replaced with green infrastructure, you know, re reduces, you know, nutrient flows to the lagoon somehow. It's something we want to know about, right? So, uh, absolutely. And I'll you, I'll, when, when th you, that's our challenge, right? Is that, we have to show developers yeah. that through projects that get implemented that, hey, this isn't expensive, too expensive to build. This isn't too expensive to maintain. We can actually improve, increase the amount of buildable land you have by implementing these practices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And here's the dollars and cents of doing what, what, what I would call gray infrastructure, gray meaning concrete pipes, concrete mm -hmm. uh, versus green infrastructure. And when we really start to show developers that this is a tool that can actually assist and give them more buildable land, I think we're going to start to see that conversation, mm -hmm. conversation shift. So the challenge we have right now, David, is just we've got uh, engineers get paid to do one project, not two. So it's rare that you would look at a conventional gray infrastructure design and then look at a green infrastructure design and say, which one's better? We're going to go with this one because it costs a lot to design sure. both of them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we work constantly. Municipalities are traditionally the ones that are installing this technology first. Many a times, number one, we talked about the nutrient benefits that they, that, that, that they receive out of it, so that's important for them. But the other thing is they're the leaders in this space. They're saying, hey, if I'm going to ask a developer to do this, which many communities are, uh, I want to show them that we're willing to do this as well. And maybe we can even bring them to this little area and show them how this is working and, and that it's not this big scary thing that everyone's been saying is a bad thing, but it actually can go to work for them. So we're, we're working to put things like that together. Are you, you're going to be at the MRC? Conference? I will be at the MRC conference, okay. yes, sir. All right, thank you. Yes, sir.
All right. Uh, oh, now, I one. Well, Todd, Todd has a question, but while, Chris, can you put up that MRC slide just while we're, Todd has a question, but I didn't want to plug that again because I do think it's a good conference. Last year was amazing. Um, Todd, did you have a question? And then uh, Lorraine. Uh, yeah, really just a comment on um, definitely a supporter of green infrastructure. I think all of these solutions have um, a, a long enough history. They've been demonstrated to work, and in many cases, uh, they are a pretty nominal cost differential and and candidly are can be better integrated with a, a very attractive environment and so you know things that people are looking for you know uh, um, so I, I'm definitely a supporter but the one watch out and I think an important piece for us is the comments on maintenance um, I don't know that in most cases the maintenance is drastically increased but it's different it's often different than the structures that the municipalities are set up to, to have in place uh, the pervious payment. And you saw a slide, it has to be vacuumed. It has to, so it is a change, and, so, and in some instances, it'll fall on the municipalities or the local governments. In other cases, it'll move upstream into whether it's a condo association or HOA or whoever. So just I definitely advocate for this, but I think we've got to bring maintenance into the conversation and ensure that if we're driving this, that, that we're, we're hopefully also pushing for ways to make sure that, one, people understand what those maintenance needs to are, and two, that, that hopefully we're pushing for whether it's escrow funds or approaches or other ways to ensure that they've got, that they're on tra track for maintaining these things functionally, because uh, it, it, that is very important to achieve the, the outcomes that, that are projected through these approaches. Thank yeah, you. It's, you are so right. And just to comment on that, maintenance is a conversation that we have with anybody before we talk to them about putting this stuff in the ground. Mm -hmm. The reality of it is if you put this in and don't maintain it, you might as well have just paved with asphalt or you might as well have just put in drains and pipe because it does need to be maintained. So that is an awesome point and a conversation that we have with every single person we're talking to when we design these types of systems. And the other thing that I would say is um, you're maintaining these big muddy ponds right now. You're doing it with pesticides. You're doing it by mowing the pond banks. And at the end of the day, people don't realize it, but what are we, why are we dredging? <laughs> We're dredging because all that stuff went in there. So guess what? These stormwater ponds that are sitting in your community right now, in your neighborhood, in your condominium association, on your property, if you own property, uh, a retail center, the day's coming when that pond needs to be dredged and dug out because it was built to manage a certain volume of water, David, as we said before. And if it's full of half with sediments, guess what? It's not doing its job anymore. So when it comes time to pay that piper, which is typically done every 20 to 30 years, it's not that much, really, it's probably more, quite frankly, than it would have been just to maintain some green infrastructure along the way. So people, a lot of times, don't think of stormwater best management practices as something that need to be maintained, because it's not until it's a catastrophic event that typically they get looked at. So maintenance, you're paying for it right now, whether you realize it or not. And if you haven't, you're going to pay a really big bill at one point in time in the future. So. Um, and, and, you know, there'll be other opportunities. This, this conference that's on the screen right now is an excellent opportunity to learn more about green infrastructure, way more than I have to talk to you about it today. But um, maintenance is a really critical thing to remember, think about, and understand and will need to be done if you're going to use these practices. <clears throat> Thank you. And I, yeah, I think it's like a paradigm shift, Todd, like you were saying. It's different maintenance. You know, mm -hmm. like that permeous concrete. Can you just flip it over? Is that a trade mm -hmm. secret? Did I just give it away? Because if water runs through it, you could flip it over and water went through the other way. No, I'm joking anyway. <laughs> Um, Lorraine, although maybe that's how it works. Yeah, the, don't, don't the maintenance issue the is sauce. so big, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad it'll be addressed at this conference. But uh, I have a much more simple question. So the porous concrete, I've just been told that that's just too expensive to even consider. Is that still the case, or is it coming down? And what is the structure below the porous concrete? So the structure below any porous surface is traditionally going to be a stone base. That stone base operates as a reservoir, so that gives mm -hmm. a place when the water goes off the surface, where is it going to go? It goes into a reservoir. We can build dip, lots of different ways to do that, but typically there's a stone base below that. That also provides structural support, so you can drive dump trucks and fire trucks and all that stuff that you normally do on any pavement you would ever drive on. In terms of cost, um, I would say uh, that it 
you know, like those panels I showed you are, are somewhere around $30, 25 to $30 a square foot, depending on where you are in the state in terms of delivery. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in general, the costs of green infrastructure are coming down. Yes, because technology, when technology is technology grows, costs kind of tend to come down. Uh, but in terms of like regular pour, in, like a, a normally concrete, porous concrete's manufactured right where it's installed. And there are a lot of challenges with doing that. So um, a lot of failures can happen if it's not made exactly correctly. Maybe it won't let water go through, which then you might as well not even built it in the first place. Um, maybe it, it ravels. In other words, it falls apart really quickly. Uh, it's not uh, durable. All those things really tie into manufacturing. And if those things aren't done exactly right, then guess what? You get to come back and replace it. Or look at that as an eyesore, and every city official says, we're never doing that again because we just wasted a bunch of money. So um, you know, I think pour in place concrete to man manufacture somewhere around 12 to 15 dollars a square foot but it comes with a lot of risk so um, so there are great new technologies that are really changing how often things need to be maintained how they continue to function and work um, so I think a lot has changed in the green infrastructure and it really is like Vinny said a paradigm shift it's a different way of thinking about water um, and, and I can give you one cost somebody asked about costs that that this community that I showed you um, see if I can get my little mouse and not break the screen again. But this community that I showed you here, originally it was pipe and gutter system. There's a whole story behind this. The pipe and gutter system was $450 a linear foot, $450 per linear foot. That was the estimated cost to build the, the traditional curb gutter pipe pond. That thing got built for $250 a linear foot, substantially cheaper than putting concrete and all that stuff in the ground. So there are case studies and things where we can say, here's the cost of one, here's the cost of another. Um, Jeff Huber gave me that information when I, I, I do a presentation, kind of a summary on this, but $450 versus $250. And this was actually a, 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 um, a Habitat for Humanity community, which is probably one of the reasons why they did it, because it was actually a cheaper way to manage water, and they gave all these residents these amazing amenities instead of a big muddy pond that they had to deal with. So, yeah. All right. Hopefully that Todd, answers your question, Lorraine. Todd's got his hand up again. Todd, did you have something further? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to add in on the cost element thing is that um, I think there are some opportunities, one, to look more holistically at cost because, uh, you know, I have no question that if you compare pervious pavement or, or porous concrete to traditional, it is going to be more expensive in most instances. But when you start looking at it, um, as some of these natural systems as an amenity, uh, it, there may be some opportunity to offset cost of other amenities, as well as looking at the other uh, cost implications long term. Um, so we started off our meeting with our budget. We're dumping lots of money into restore, restoring the lagoon. We've got economic damages due to nutrient issues, all of those kinds of things. So I, I, I think this, there's an element of this that is a traditional pay me now or pay me later approach that we need to look at um, kind of current net present value of, of what the long-term cost of either using some of these systems that may cost a little more upfront or uh, recognizing what the longer-term cost associated with, you know, corrective actions or, or that there's also offset costs in other areas of projects that where people may want the amenities and that a you know stormwater or other this type of infrastructure can serve a dual purpose and so in in that light i think you'll find that the costs start to uh close in on each other as well yeah awesome thank you i love how much you know about green infrastructure we, you should be up here at the podium talking about this <laughs> thanks those are all great comments and totally agree with everything you're saying all right, anyone have any other comment? Oh, David, yes. Just uh, one thought. So this, uh, you've got some incredible tools here to manage things like storm surges that happen in our area. Um, and a lot of the residential properties that are basically changing over what's happening is you're seeing small lots that are near the water right go from a 2,000 square foot roof to a 5,000 square foot roof so that there's no water that can get in and suddenly you've got a bigger storm surge problem. The pipes are too small to get out the lagoon as it is. People need to have tools like permeable pavers and other things in the toolbox, but even educating them, I'm curious, are you going from city to city, like for example, City of Cocoa Beach, and educating their wastewater you know, people, their storm surge people, um, their code enforcement, et cetera, on these tools being available that they could say, hey, when they look at is this new construction 
going to meet our ability to deal with our, you know, water uh, that's going to be our storm surge water uh, that they could basically suggest, hey, you should check out these perennial pavers, hey, you should check out these retention systems, et cetera. Uh, going through and doing that sort of education might be a way that they are your salespeople um, in some ways and give them some tools that could really make things better for everybody. Yeah, I'd say that we uh, that the conversation has started. It started long before us, and it'll go on long probably after us. So we really are just a, a support tool. I think a lot of times folks say, yeah, we need to do this, but how do we get it done? And that's really where I think Ferguson's role comes in is, yes, you know, as these cities and, and counties are implementing these technologies, developers start implementing these technologies, we are the product folks that can say, hey, look, here's your menu of solutions that you can choose from. Here's the benefits of them. Here's the cons of them. Which ones would work best for your project? So, um, so we really assist municipalities and engineers as they're designing these things. And I, I mean, I have, I'm standing here in front of you today because I'm an advocate for this. I mean, I really believe that this is the only way that we are going to change the water in, in, in uh, the water quality everywhere. You cannot make those pipes <laughs> take on any more water. Sorry, folks, it's science. You, if they're buried in the lagoon, you can't put any more water in them. And when it rains and water shows up in front of your home, and it didn't do that five years ago, it's because the water has nowhere to go. We can't put more water in the lagoon just because it simply can't take it. So tell me a better way to deal with water. I can't think of one. And again, that's why I'm so passionate about what we do and advocate for it so much. Thanks. You're yeah. a really good spokesperson. So. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, all right. Any other questions? Okay. Just two things, and then uh, we'll hear from Chris again on BAM. But uh, one of the things, um, for those of you, again, and I, I keep going back to history, I don't know. I, I think it's always interesting that people that have come up and spoke at our uh, committee, but Keith Winston, the director at the zoo, talked, oh, man, it was way back in the early days, about um, the market actually proving why we ought to do these things. And I think what Chris was saying, where you can make a development cheaper by going green than gray, that's the market catching up. So it's not just us saying we should do it, it's actually the dollars saying that it should be done. So I think that's one of the things. And then as David said, I know it's something we're looking at, and I'm sure Eric and Susan as being in the real estate lane would understand, property values are going up. And so if you buy a small home that was built in the 50s on a piece of land, if you're gonna build on that house in order to return on your investment of what you paid for the land, you're going to build a bigger house, a bigger footprint. And with that bigger footprint comes loss of green space. So I think it's really important. Um, and I would ask everybody out there to invite their city managers, their city staff to go to this LID conference um, and have that conversation because I think that's, that's how it starts. So. Um, and thanks, Vinny. And, and if you are out there listening and you want to learn more about this stuff, like myself, I have colleagues, we talk about this all the time. We'd love to come and talk to your town, your city, um, your, your, your community about how green infrastructure can help with some problems that you may be experiencing right now. We do that all the time. So my con you can get my, you'll see my contact information again. We'd love to come out and talk to you about what this stuff is. It's the only way we're going to get a change is we're all working together to make, to make it happen. So we are available to do that. All thanks, right. Vinny. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll hear again from uh, Chris again on the BAM. You oh. <laughs> <laughs> speaking next? Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll take a short uh, break after this, five-minute break. So if everyone can just, just hold tight, we'll, uh, we'll take a break after this. This is the part where I say, don't attempt to adjust your screen. It is me again talking about BAM, <laughs> Biosorption Activated Media. So this is uh, a less exciting topic, but a really, really important topic. Um, I shared a little bit about my passion and love for the environment. My background in this lies in um, 2015, um, I started working with the University of Central Florida. They have a BAM product called Bold and Gold. And so I've worked very closely with the university, particularly a, an awesome man named Dr. Wanalista, to learn a lot about this stuff. So I know enough to be dangerous and talk to everyone here. And, and I'm talking to you again as a guy that just 
lives and enjoys water, right? So I, I'm, I hope that I speak in a way that you understand what I'm talking about because this is pretty scientific stuff. So I try to break it down um, and make it to where everyone can understand. So this is called Biosorption Activated Media or BAM. I've never felt so cool as saying BAM because there's that guy, Emerald Lagasse, you know, who made that cool. Uh, but this is not as fun or cool, but I will say BAM every now and again. So biosorption, that's the word we're going to focus on, right? So sorption is a process that occurs with solid media to build up or concentrate pollutants. Um, so basically, pollutants bind or contact, it, it absorb or attach onto um, the, the media itself, sorb. Um, activation, that's that, that biological portion, bio, biological. So activation occurs when the media and the working environment are altered to improve removal, sometimes by physical measures or biological means. All of the BAM I'm going to talk about today create an environment where bacteria can live to convert nitrogen. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So BAM is a media for pollutant removal that has sorption properties uh, in a specific environment. Okay, And um, so how it works, nitrogen removal. Physical filtration, every single BAM material, I like to think of it as dirt. It really, at the end of the day, is fancy dirt. So when water goes through that, it's got a lot of particles, a lot of stuff that it's picked up along the roadways, and it gets captured in the BAM. So all those particles have pollution attached to them of some sort. So physical filtration, grabbing those particles and holding it in the media, every BAM is going to work and physically filtrate particles. Denitrification, this is that biological process that I talked about, and it's really a chemical, uh, uh, I'm going I'm to say either way, it goes from nitrate to nitrogen gas. That's what happens. These bacteria essentially feed on nitrate, and they give off nitrogen gas, and we're all breathing that right now. It's in the air. So this, uh, it all happens in an anaerobic condition, and that means that in that environment, there's no air. There's no oxygen available. So that's very, very critical for any BAM material to work it must be void of oxygen in order for this process right here to happen, okay? And then the, the removal, how much nitrogen comes out of the water, is all a factor of how much time those bacteria have to feed on nitrogen. The longer the water is in touch with the BAM material, the longer those bugs have, they eat and eat on nitrate and convert that. So residency time, they call that hydraulic residency time, is very, very important, okay? And we need a minimum of 15 minutes. That's really critical. So whenever we design these systems or we think about a BAM material, we've got to have at least 15 minutes that that water is in contact with the BAM so that those bugs can do their work. And bacteria, these bugs that do this work, are ubiquitous, and that means basically they're in the soils. One of the reasons why we put water or try to put water into the ground is because these bugs are doing some activity. Native soils even operate as a BAM because these bugs are in there. The problem with native soils are they dry out, right? So it's, they're wet. When they're wet, they move into that anaerobic state. When they go dry, they move into an aerobic state. So I like to think of those bugs, they hibernate, essentially. When that favorable environment goes away, they go to sleep. And when it rains and that environment comes back and it goes anoxic or without oxygen again, they start to wake up. So what the ultimate goal of a BAM is to create like the Ritz-Carlton of places to live, right? Because then they all want to come there, they stay active, they stay healthy, and they do the most amount of work. Um, so every BAM material is going to try and hold or keep that, that moisture or the, for, the, for the anaerobic environment to work. Phosphorus removal is totally, totally different. Physical filtration still, right, because the BAM material is capturing particles that have phosphorus on them. So that's always going to be the case. Uh, but then and what the process that really takes away orthophosphorus or dissolved phosphorus is what you see on the screen, sorption, precipitation, ion exchange. Um, basically, all that orthophosphorus attaches or sorbs onto the media itself. And it happens in an anaerobic or an aerobic condition. It doesn't matter. That's going to happen. And for this reason, because we're parking, putting this orthophosphorus on the, the BAM material, it has a life expectancy. I like to think of it as a parking lot. If you go shopping at Publix and you want to park your car in the parking lot, there's only so many parking spaces that you can park in. If all of those parking spaces are full, then you're going on down the road to the next grocery store. Well, BAM works the same way. It can only hold so much dissolved phosphorus. And when it's all full, it just stops taking out phosphorus. It still takes out the, the nitrogen. It's still capturing the particulate forms of pollutants, but it's no longer capturing orthophosphorus. So it's in, and when it's full, it just needs to be replaced if phosphorus is your primary pollutant of concern. In terms of maintenance for BAM, water has to be able to flow through it. 
It has to be able to move water. So for that reason, the media must not be clogged. How does it get clogged? Well, remember we talked, it's taken on particulates. It's taken on different things in the storm water. So that's going to clog it up and make it to where it can't take any more water. It'll stop working. At that point, it would need to be replaced. Pretreatment is really critical. In many of the designs where we use BAM, there's some sort of pretreatment upstream, whether it be maybe a baffle box or something to collect sediments. Maybe it's a, a different type of filter, but essentially we want to grab as much of those particulates as we can before it gets to the BAM because we can maintain those pretreatment devices or those pretreatment um, technologies but, and protect the BAM, protect the expensive stuff so we don't have to replace that. So pretreatment is really, really critical. And there's lots of different BMPs that can be used um, to do that. And then I mentioned this earlier, there's only so much room for orthophosphorus. So uh, when the, the media is full of orthophosphorus, it needs to be replaced. That's just plain and simple, and that's going to be the case for any BAM material. Depending on the BAM material is going to depend on how much phosphorus it can hold. And there's lots of different things that you can use to make a BAM material, right? So all these things can be used in some way, shape, or form or mixed together to, uh, to create a BAM. And what I, I'm going to point out here, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, is organic material in BAM has the potential to decompose. And when organic material like sawdust or wood chips or compost or any of that stuff decomposes that actually puts off pollutants. It puts off different pollutants that go in the water. So there are a lot of BAM material that aren't used in certain applications because they actually contribute more pollutants than they take out. So it's really important to understand when you're using a BAM material, how is it being used? Okay, and I'll talk about that as I show you where it goes. So manufacturing is really, really important. In order for a BAM material to work, it's got to be made correctly. So we like, and I suggest using pug mill equipment, as you can see over here on your right-hand side. Manually it's mixed. Depending on the type of BAM material you're making, that is an acceptable practice, meaning that you put a pile of one thing in uh, over here and put a pile of one thing over here and you mix it together in some sort of manual fashion, but uniform mixing is very, very important. Uh, in order for this stuff to work, as I talked about for nitrogen removal, the water's got to stay in the media for a certain period of time. If it's not mixed correctly, you get what's called preferential flow paths, meaning that water could maybe just find like a wormhole, so to say, and just go right through there and bypass the entire natural process that's supposed to be happening, and the band material doesn't work. So mixing this material and doing it in a, in a, in a quality control fashion is really, really important. Uh, as I say here, so the consistency of the mix is important. Uh, I'm just going to use wood chips as an example because we're going to talk about that here in a second. But when I say I'm going to make a band material out of wood chips, where am I getting those wood chips from? If they were trees that were chopped up that were pulling up pesticides, guess what? That's in your band material. Uh, the, the size of all the different component materials that you use are really important. Some big things don't like mixing with little things, so you can't get a homogenous mix or like a really consistent mix. Um, so the type of material that you use must be consistent, uh, and, it, and, it, and, and it's important in terms of performance. If you're an engineer and you're designing something, we talked a little bit about with David's question, um, and you say, hey, I'm going to put a bunch of water in this BAM swale, and it needs to recover. That water needs to go away in 24 hours. Well, if you're using eight different types of sand to make your BAM, or you're using eight different types of clay to make your BAM, how are you going to get guarantee consistency? So that goes back to the manufacturing process, where you're resourcing your materials and making sure that's consistent. So the engineers, the scientists doing their work have tools that actually function the same every single time. It's really, really important. So here's how BAM works. Uh, this is a rain garden, green infrastructure practice. So you see this, this area right here, which normally would be some type of just native soil, maybe a planting soil. I'm you sorry. I don't have any places to show. <laughs> Woo. Siri wants I don't know where Siri's that came. So Siri, Siri just went off on me. Siri, I'm showing you where you can put BAM. I'm showing you right now. Um, but no, so the BAM material can be used in a rain garden. And I talked about pretreatment. You see this little area right here? That can be sand or that can be some sort of growing medium. But essentially, that's grabbing a lot of that sediment and stuff before it gets into the BAM material. This is a downflow application. What I mean by that is you put water in the top and it comes out the bottom. We need 15 minutes of contact time. We talked about that. So if you use BAM materials that aren't going to hold on to water, aren't going to slow that flow of water down to give those bugs time to do their work, it won't work. So there are certain types of BAM that work really good in certain types of, of applications. Um, in this one, I like a, a sand-based media that's going to slow the water down and give time for those bugs to work. 
Really, really important. Um, and we showed this picture earlier, rain gardens. You can throw BAM right in these things, and, and you would never even know that it was under there doing work. Tree wells, we showed you those a little bit earlier. Those all have some type of soil in the box where plants can grow. Well, guess what? That can be a BAM material as well. Again, this is a downflow application, so how we use BAM and how it's being implemented into these BMPs is very, very important. And tree wells, we showed some pictures of those. Permeable surfaces, another excellent opportunity to use BAM because it goes down below all that stone structure I talked about. You can put a layer of BAM in there. Downflow application, again, really important to make sure that we maintain or, or hold on to a certain flow through rate. And we can put those all under all kinds of different surfaces like this. So you can see you can incorporate BAM. Every application typically is incorporated into some type of a structural BMP, structural best management practice, or a stormwater best management practice. Uh, wet pond, polishing filters, really, really uh, a great tool. So um, in the bank of your pond, uh, if you think about all those wet ponds we see, you can actually put filters in there. So when the water comes up, it actually goes into these filters and cleans the water as it's leaving the pond. Really effective tool. There's a bunch of different ways to get this done. And some pictures of showing it, literally it sits right in the bank of the pond. You could do it with new construction. You could retrofit these things in. But it's as simple as dropping the BAM in there. You put grass over the top of it, and you're all done. Really great, uh, a great tool. Uh, upflow filters. Switch gears now, upflow filters. Why we say that? Water enters at the bottom and flows up through the BAM material and out, right? Why do we do that? Well, we want to slow the flow of water down so we give time for these biological practices to happen. We control that flow through rate not with the BAM material itself, not the BAM allowing water to go one way, but we control by how much water do we put into the system to create that residency time so that the, the BAM material can work. So this is an example of an upflow filter. Um, and this application, when you start to move water up, you don't need that control anymore of slowing the water down. You don't need maybe a sand. Sand's too slow. So we typically use things like wood chips or like other BAM products that have bigger openings that water can really move through easily. And in these situations, this area right here is constantly saturated. It's constantly underwater. That keeps the anaerobic environment. The BAM isn't totally doing that. It's really the design that we created in this, in this instance that is maintaining that anaerobic environment. So again, there's different ways to do this. Vegetative filter strips. These are actually little grassed areas. They're everywhere. On the side of every single road, you've got a paved road. Mm -hmm. Typically, there's a shoulder. And then there's that grass swale area off to the right. Well, we can put BAM in under that. We're doing this on a lot of DOT projects right now because they don't want to buy expensive land to build ponds to maintain nutrients. We use these vegetative filter strips instead. Uh, and this is an example of one of these going in. This was up in uh, Fanning Springs. You can see it's really simple. Dig down a hole. The BAM goes in at a prescribed thickness. Um, in this application, we compacted the BAM because cars may drive off the side of the road. We want to make sure that it was very safe. And then grass goes right on top of that. Very, very simple. You'd never even know that it was there, but it's taken out nitrogen and phosphorus from our waterways. Um, so some actual performance data. This was a project we did. This was a, uh, uh, a DOT project up in Fanning Springs. And they wanted to compare wood chips, which you see over here to the right-hand side, to this bold and gold CTS media is what it was called. It's important. Look at what I'm talking about right now. You're seeing two examples of BAM. On the left, sand. Water's going to move a lot slower through it. Um, and on the right, wood chips. Really open and porous. If you were to pour water over that, it's just probably going to fall straight through there. So there's no residency time. Um, so we put these, did this study for a year. And here's what we found with nutrient removal. Wood chips. They actually decomposed. They emitted pollutants into the environment. It's a bad application, not a bad BAM. It's very important to understand that water, if it goes too, through too fast, then all the ways BAM is supposed to work, it can't work. Mm -hmm. And when you switch from an aerobic to an anaerobic environment, and you do it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. decomposition happens. This is just science, folks. So when decomposition happens, this is what you see happen. So nitrogen was going in at 5 milligrams per liter and coming out at 17 milligrams per liter. Really bad, right? And this is not just one independent study. This is, you can find it everywhere. And this is one of the reasons why in downflow applications, wood chips may not be the best BAM material or solution. On the same, same exact everything on the other side of the, or on the end of the ditch, this was the bold and gold. So again, 5 milligrams per liter was what was going in. 
what was coming out was under one milligram per liter. Mm -hmm. Every BEM material can work. It just needs to be used in the right way. And here's another example, wood chips. This is called a bioreactor, used very, very common in agricultural applications. Um, and we've put lots of these filters in actually right here in Brevard County. And they function and work great. Why? Because of how the water moves through them. That's what's so important. So you're seeing wood chips. This is if you were looking from the top down. And then this is if you flipped it on its side. So in a situation like this, they're putting water into the system. It's going down here and it's moving across the wood chips. That's how we're getting that residency time, right? It's moving very slowly across the wood chip. We're putting in water at a controlled rate so that it doesn't go too fast and all those bugs can do their work. And these are incredibly effective. Um, this is a project that was done up in Suwannee River. Um, this was on a farm, so understand that, <laughs> thank God we're not dealing with levels of 28 milligrams per liter nitrogen, but on some agricultural ac uh, places they do. Well, look at how great the BAM filter worked in this application, right? This was the inflow, so by 20 up to 30 milligrams per liter nitrogen. And at the monitoring well, look at how much nitrogen was coming out. Worked incredibly well. It's all about how you use the material, right? So that's, that's what's critical are, are the, is, is really flow path and how it's used. So all these band materials can work well in the right applications. Um, really cool project and huge thanks to this group right here for putting in these in-ground nitrogen reducing drain fields, bioreactor drain fields using a media, a band media. This is a law that is written into the Department of Environmental Protection right now. You can use wood chip media in this exact configuration. The challenge, it's science. Water, as it's going down through those wood chips, it's not working. They are decomposing. That happened, the, the ground may settle. So if I have a drain field at my house. I love my drain field. Um, but I don't want my ground settling in, in my front yard. So we put uh, six of these systems in the ground uh, here in Brevard County about two years ago with the help of these two awesome guys over here. We spent a lot of time in a hole in the middle of July, which was the worst, uh, that hole right there. Um, so what you're seeing in this picture is those big black buck pans. These geniuses over here, Matt, I'll say Matt and Anthony, made these things and that's what collects the water. So when the water goes down through the drain field, it collected in these pans and we were able to take samples to say, how is this stuff working? And at the end of the day, it looks just like a drain field folks. You put this BAM material under and you forget about it. It lasts 30 years. Uh, well, the bold and gold BAM that we used in this application is scheduled to last 30 years. You never have to maintain it. The bugs just keep doing their work. And it's not a raised fee for those homeowners that we just heard a little story about earlier today. So this is near and dear to my heart because septic tanks are a problem, folks. But there's opportunities for us to clean up and do some things and maybe not take septic tanks away if they're not in a really detrimental area like right on the lagoon, right? So this was monitored. The, the uh, draft report is available. Um, I would say that comfortably, we're, th these systems were removing over 60% of the nitrogen coming out of drain fields. And it was nothing more than when you replace your drain field, instead of putting the drain field material on top of native soil, you just put some BAM below it and you forget about it. It's an awesome solution that isn't gonna have a big impact on those homeowners that just can't afford or don't wanna lose their drain field. So another great way BAM is used and um, that's, that's my talk. So hopefully I talked in a way that it was understandable. Um, there's a lot of science that I did not cover uh, because, quite frankly, I don't understand it all, right? But if you have other questions or more technical questions, I can get you pointed to the right people that can answer them for you. <clears throat> awesome. All right, Chris. Thank you. Lorraine, yes. Well, I wanted to ask the uh, last slide you showed. What was the BAM material? It was that? So this, the, the pictures I'm showing you here are oh, from the God. Brevard County yeah. study that was done. Yeah that those six drain fields used bold and gold in them. Okay. So this was. And is that, that's like a rubber based material? Or? So the, so I think you had a this, picture of it, Chris, right in the hand. Remember do, you've yeah. got wood chips and then the bold and gold pictures. This is it here right. on the left hand side. This is the, the this is the bold and gold material okay. that we used. And it was a mixture of sand, clay, recycled tire, and it also had some sawdust in it. Mm -hmm. And again, the science of that is in order to make the nitrate go to nitrogen gas, you've got to have a carbon donor. Right. You have to have carbon. Um, if you have dealing with stormwater and you've got really low concentrations of nitrogen, you don't need a lot of carbon. Right. But when you start dealing with concentrations coming out of septic tanks, you need some carbon. And so the bold and gold material that we used in this application used a very small percentage of organics because 
They will decompose over time, mm -hmm. but in a drain field, because they're constantly getting saturated with water, um, you, you don't need a lot. So the, the goal really with a downflow application, in my opinion, is use the least amount of organics possible because that's what's going to decompose over time. So okay. this material used sand, clay, recycled tire, and, and wood chips. Uh, or sorry, sawdust. I will say with recycled tire, you said that, yeah. and that, that that's right. a question that a lot of people have. Tire's bad. We've always heard tire is a bad thing. Tire is a bad thing, folks. But the tire that's used in this BAM material is certified from the manufacturer, part of the quality control process, 99.9% .9 metal free. Metals are going to be one of the things um, in this application. It's buried. It's in the ground. You're never going to inhale it. Mm -hmm. It does not give off any toxic. There are no toxic effects of this. And we have testing going back the University of Central Florida started working on BAM materials in 2007. They've got EPA testing done that shows this stuff has no harmful uh, So it effects. doesn't deteriorate. And it doesn't deteriorate. And that's what's really, really critical about a good BAM material. It doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't decompose. There is absolutely nothing coming from the tire chrome in that bold and gold that's doing any harm to anything. And we've got study after study to prove that. And honestly, we've had to do that because there is a, there is an under, you know, tire is bad. We've heard that our whole entire lives. What's its function in the van? Carbon. So two functions. Number one, there's carbon black in tire. So in a stormwater application, remember what I said, we don't need a lot of carbon. There's a very small amount of, of tire crumb in the, in the mix. So it contributes a little bit of carbon. That And surface area is really important. So again, getting a little bit scientific, but these bacteria, they need a place to sit. They need a place to live. So in the BAM material, the bold and gold, the clay has a lot of surface area, which means that gives a lot of places for these bugs to park and live. And the tire crumb does the same thing. So it gives a lot of surface area. So BAM creates that environment, that, that Ritz-Carlton, so to say, where we can get the most bugs living as possible. That's what the tire does, and, and that's what the clay does as well. So I understand, trust me, we, 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 uh, as we've taken this bold and gold band material outside the state of Florida and helped other states with their nutri nutrient problems, the number one question we're asked about is tire. And there's been a lot of research done on that, and we'd be happy to provide anyone with information related to that, because I think there are some, some rumors, quite frankly, about what that tire crumb is actually doing in the band material. It's a very small amount. For, for a tire to decay you might carbon, go. to the... You might go. The water. Oh, yeah. We should just have David keep Sorry. his mic on. I like David. He asks a lot of questions. <laughs> for, for a tire to contribute carbon to um, these chemical processes that are occurring, there's going to be VOCs that are also released. You, you, you can't, a tire can't just keep all of its VOCs while releasing carbon. Um, so I'm sure those are part of the studies. I'd like to see those. Yep. Um, and I'm sure they're fine. It's just it's a question that comes up to me. No, and it's a great question. And again, in a stormwater application, typically there's enough carbon in stormwater mm -hmm. to facilitate the denitrification process. Um, that tire, the, the, the carbon black available in that tire is, is not around for a long time. So at that point, it really becomes a surface area tool, moreover than continuously con contributing carbon, which is the reason why in the drain fields, we had to add an organic component to that because we needed to increase the amount of carbon is it and it wouldn't be ready and it wouldn't be available in a tire product. You would call it like a Kickstarter? That's what I would okay. call it. All yeah, right. that's a great, a great point. And yeah, those VOCs and things you're talking about, those are all the things that we've monitored through toxicity testing to prove time and time again that it's not putting off any pollutants. And it's really critical. I mean, I'm, when we make bold and gold, I think one of the things that is uh, maybe a misnomer again is, oh, well, there's tires on the side of the road. So you just go pick up a couple of those guys, you dig a hole in your backyard, and uh, you grab some clay. And I can promise you that the practice is totally different. Where we source those materials are critically important to the functioning, to, to this stuff functioning. And, uh, you know, to me, I want to make sure that that water's protected. And if we're doing something that's disruptive to that, I wouldn't be involved in it, I can promise you. But we've got lots of studies to show that. Thank you. Great questions. Stephanie? Because you just made that point, uh, the sawdust is what you're putting in to provide the carbon. So it is going to eventually run out, correct? So part of what happens is as a, sep as a drain septic tank starts to do its thing years down the road, there's a lot more total available carb, total TOC, total, what am I saying? Organic carbon, thank you. 
total available stuck in my head. There's a lot of total organic carbon that is generated over time in a septic tank that now you've got a new carbon source and it's not those, those, those wood chips or, or sawdust. So as we developed that media and there was a ton of time that went into it, the recipe was like, we got to put in just enough to get it kick started. Good word. But we can't put too much in because we don't want pollutants coming out of this stuff. So in all the research that, that the Brevard County did or the sampling they did over the course of the last year, they were monitoring things like that to make sure that pollutants weren't being emitted into the environment. So it's a, this isn't, like I said, this isn't just go grab some, some corn cob or some wood chips or some um, biochar. There's really a science to this. And I personally believe the University of Central Florida is the authority on this because they've been working on it for so long but that we really had to be careful of that. Good question. All right. Well, I hate to interrupt, but I've got a follow-up to that question. Mike? Yeah. <laughs> so you just keep it I've on. I've got a follow-up to that question. On. You talk about the life of the BAM, and eventually it's got to be replaced, is, um, is where you have BAM that's got to contribute carbon to these chemical processes, is that what determines the end of life of the BAM? Uh, that it's that the, the wood chips are no longer working that the, the tire piece tire chips are no longer providing any carbon eventually there's you know there's no, there's no carbon left right yeah so, so again that's all going to be contingent on the process if you're dealing with stormwater a lot of the BMPs I showed you in stormwater carbon's going to be in the stormwater so you don't need a resource for it um, in septic tanks there's a lot of carbon coming out of that through that process so you, so it's really the water is containing the amount that we need in those applications, and we would really need to understand what the concentrations of, of carbon were in the influent water to know, do we need to supplement that process, or is there enough there that we can just let the natural order of things take over and we create a BAM material that knows that that water is going to be, be, have certain characteristics? So the life of the BAM is almost always, I hate to use that word, but because it eventually clogs up and is no longer allowing the water flow that it was designed to. That's one way, or the other way is if phosphorus is your pollutant of concern, it'll fill up with orthophosphorus, and then you won't be taking out any more phosphorus. So the reason why we say 30 years in septic tanks, and, and I'm only speaking right now to the bold and gold because that's what I know about, um, we know the, the sorption capacity of phosphorus. So we can say this is what's coming out of the septic tank annually. This is how much room we have to keep phosphorus in the BAM material, and we can calculate or estimate how long that's going to be. Typical drain field life is 30 years, and in this application, we expect that the phosphorus sorption capacity in it for this application would be 40 or 50 years. So that's why I say it doesn't need to be replaced before the, the drain field. Phosphorus life. is the is the nutrient you're in this project that you're the DOT is most concerned about? In this one, it was actually nitrogen. Typically okay. in springs or really what we're dealing with in the lagoon primarily is nitrogen, which is why we're focused okay. on all your projects are so much on nitrogen base. So, um, yeah, for, for, for the drain fields, for this project in the DOT, it, it was nitrogen based. What's the DOT looking for for a lifespan on that on the shoulder of the road? Is it? Thir we, we say 50 plus years, but 30 years, and, and in that profile, um, in this one here, there's a swale. So right above the band material, both the wood chips and the, and the bold and gold in this study was a six-inch layer of sand. That's going to capture a lot of those things that would clog the material. That's why, remember, I talked about pretreatment's really important. Mm -hmm. So in that application, if what we're shooting to do is make that top layer clog, make the cheap sand clog so that we can take the sand away, put a brand new layer of sand that's clean and free of all that stuff and leave, keep that BAM flowing water. So that, in that example, you know, typically DOT says they don't want to touch anything for 10 years. So whenever we size a BAM filter for them, it typically has to have a life of 10 years or greater and phosphorus typically drives that design. Does, hi, does that include the, the removal or the maintenance of that sand, that 10-year window, or is that maintenance of that sand layer before that 10-year for DOT or whatever the oh, projected? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, that, I don't think so. Um, when we talk in terms of maintenance on that, like I, I know if you think about these vegetated shoulders from time to time, you'll see uh, those scraped away and then resodded. Typically that happens because they're capturing so much sediment from the roadway that it builds up and now the water can't flow off the road. So I don't know if they factor that or consider that part of BAM maintenance because whether they put a BAM filter on the side of the road or whether they just have grass on the side of the road, 
typically that builds up to the point the water can't get off, and so they have to replace that anyway. So in my experience, they're mostly talking about the function, like that the lifespan of a filter or something is, do they have to replace that BAM? And the upflow filter that I showed you, um, where the water goes through, that's a great filter that they typically put after ponds. So all the water discharging from a pond would go through that filter. Well, you're putting a lot of water through maybe five or 10 cubic yards of bolding goal, or sorry, of, of a band material. It's gonna fill up with phosphorus faster than a filter maybe that was on, on the, in the pond bank that had 1,000 cubic yards of a media. So that typically is where the, the, the maintenance piece has come in with BAM is in, is in a concrete box or a vault. So that 30-year lifespan un under a septic tank, you're not going to need to touch that because it's under the septic. But on a topical kind of application here, how often is the maintenance for that sand layer required? Um, there's really no tried and true way, I'm going to put my attorney hat on again, sorry. There's really no tried and true way to say, hey, that, that, that sand, that pretreatment device is going to need to be maintained in six months or a year. Every single watershed is going to have, or contributing area basin is going to have different characteristics. So, um, you know, if I'm in a heavy tree canopied area, well, I'm going to expect a lot of leaf litter and debris to come into my filter. What I choose for a pretreatment device is probably very different for that application than if I was maybe next to the beach and we had a lot of sand that was going to run onto our parking area. That would determine maybe or be a different situation. So it really depends on on. Um, the, the water flow we expect to get and what the characteristics will be like in that water. But I've been doing this now and been involved with it for probably, well, 2015. But we really didn't start installing a lot of BAM filters, I'd say, until probably like 2018. So for four years, and I can't think of an application right now that they've had to replace that top sand layer on. So, but it's all going to depend on what water's coming to it. And I would always say to any engineer, once we understand what your, your contributing characteristics are, that's going to help us determine what tools we want to use in our toolbox to think about maintenance, to think about these things. Because maybe it's not a good tool if we've got to maintain it every two weeks. No one's going to do that. So those are, those are conversations we have. All right. Any other questions? Sorry. Turn your mic on. Oh, yeah, I'm going to. Um, <laughs> um, with, with all this BAM talk and septic to sewer conversions, I, I kind, of, kind of go into the county, I guess, but where well, there's properties that aren't fall into a category that can be converted, they're low importance. Is there, is there movement underway to say, hey, you're not, you're not going to qualify or it's too expensive or you're not important enough to get a sewer conversion uh, supplement? Um, but we can improve your drain field. And, you know, drain field is, honestly, it's, you know, a guy in a, in a tractor in one day, you know, pulls off the topsoil, tr trades out the drain field, puts in some BAM, and maybe their project is solved for the next 30 years. Well, as we learned two years, it takes about two days. Um, okay, two days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With us doing it, it takes two days. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the plan since the beginning. So re even if we read the original um, Sorrel plan, you'll see it talks about, the BAM projects because, you know, with Chris's help, we've seen this coming for a long time, mm -hmm. that this technology will be here. And it took waiting for the state rules to be modified to allow us to do that. And they were modified. Um, we continue to fight for additional, flex, you know, I don't know, not flexibility is not the right word, but just ways to um, attack the problem. Because one of the things we noticed was, uh, Using the current state rules were only useful in uh, certain sections of the county where we had enough depth of groundwater, right? So we needed, you know, so we we, we have a lot of the county that's very low, you know, um, or the groundwater is very high. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, word ceilings go into it, but we basically are working to finalize a way to make this happen where we can go and for. Way, way less money than maybe an ATU, install this, and then you don't have the ongoing maintenance requirements. So it's, so even, you know, if we can make it basically be cost competitive with a normal subject tank, we can almost get everyone to just. I know that different BAM's it. gonna require different thicknesses, um, and I understand our water table is, you know, the island and, and barrier islands, you're, you know, oftentimes you only have inches above the water table uh, in your septic design. Um, so I can see where you wouldn't be able to put in BAM and solve that problem. 
but higher elevations, along River Road, for example, where they could be oftentimes, you know, 20 feet above the yeah, mean water table. There's maybe, but then there's parts of um, Indian River Drive that are the ground because of the coquina shelf. The groundwater actually yeah. comes to the surface, mm -hmm. so you have to, we have to work closely with DOH to help to locate these areas where we have enough um, room. Well, thank you. And, and this, this rule is new, by the way, and when I say new, I would say maybe four years old that the Department of Health came out with this rule. So there, there wasn't a lot of data on these systems. Mm -hmm. And um, quite frankly, scientifically, wood chips will not work in this application. They will decompose and they will, they will, they will not work. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing that the state had in the rule that you could use was a wood chip and sand-based media. And I don't think that that was thoroughly state. vetted. <laughs> um, so what we had to do with the help of Brevard County what is we had to show the them that there is an alternative media or an alternative BAM that would work. Yep. And we just got done doing that. Now, there are some challenges the way the rules are written. The Department of Health, now the DEP, have written rules that say you can start to use things like liners, and there's ways that we can keep groundwater out and use BAM materials in other conditions. So we we will be working on, with the Department of Health, or now it's the Department of Environmental Protection, I'm sorry, to figure out how can we do that, and then we're probably going to have to test them all over again and show that this actually functions and works, which I believe in that process. It's healthy to test and make sure we're not putting things in the ground that don't work. Um, but there are, they are coming up with new solutions to help folks that maybe don't have those ideal conditions where they've got four feet to the groundwater because we don't, that's not where we live, right? So um, we're working on that. And, I, and I'm confident that, I mean, we already have the designs done. We just got to show the Department of Environmental Protection from a scientific standpoint that they will function and work. So they're coming, but this is still relatively new. Uh, you know, I would say when we started this project three years ago, that this, this in-ground, the INRB project, there were probably only 50 of these in the state, and the rule had been around for a long time. So why aren't they going in the ground? The BAM's not readily available. I don't think the BAM's the right product. And quite frankly, it's a generic BAM. No one's willing to warranty it. No one's willing to say, I'll put that in your front yard, and, and when it decomposes, we'll come out and replace it. No one's going to do that. So there's really been no place that someone's taken responsibility to say, if that doesn't work, as you've written it in your rule, who's going to go fix the problem? So a lot of people haven't taken that risk on. So sorry. I feel like, and, and but for the record, Virginia, if you're listening out there, my presentations were only 15 <laughs> minutes long. <laughs> I can't help the questions, no, but, no, no. Um, it's group, but I don't want to uh, manipulate y'all's time, no, but no, I appreciate no. your interest it's, in it's it, and group. it's really important stuff, and you all are participating in all the, everything I showed you today in the county, I bet one of these soil projects have been funded and doing great work with all kinds of different BAM. So it's, it's it, you, you, you all are really a big part of the process in getting these technologies to the forefront to protect water, which is why I say I'm thankful for what the work that you're doing. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments? Comments. Microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Vinny, between you and I, man, I we're going to get David whipped for this thing here. It's getting laughable at this point. Um, we don't have a BAM uh, uh, rule for seawall backfill. Do we at all at the county? Or is that something that could be beneficial? Um, you know, th there's a lot of seawall replacement. They're all at the end of their life. Um, you know, they pull the dirt back, they rebuild the seawall, and if you had, you know, bam, there right underneath the sod. You know, regrettably, they're going to put sod all the way up to the seawall. But if you had bam, there above the water table, but below the grass you know, and, and some type of um, uh, uh, layer there uh, that was required at the time, you know, they, they backfill it, you could filter, you know, a lot of that sheet water runoff that, you know, enters these canal bodies. It's just a idea in my head that I was, you it, know, it, thinking to, would be to, beneficial. It, in an ideal world, there'd be a swale behind every single person's house right at the edge of the lagoon. And it doesn't necessarily have to have BAM, but you would collect that sheet flow. And as I mentioned earlier, the native soils do some work. Well, we have the swale requirement. Yeah, the so, lagoon, but yeah. But, no yeah, but even putting the swale there is a massive, uh, a massive improvement over what has been done. But yeah, if you put BAM in there, I mean, scientifically, all I could say to that is, 
you can put BAM at the bottom of that swale, or we call it a curtain wall. You could actually put a vertical layer of BAM yeah. in because groundwater travels, as everyone knows. And so we could actually intercept some of that groundwater that's moving from maybe five miles up that way before it gets in the lagoon. So it's an excellent scientific use of BAM. The implementation, obviously, is a whole other conversation. But that your, is a great idea, and I would say that's the reason those swales are required now and a, and a great requirement. County, cities, do it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So to, to play on Dave's question, is there, let's say you've got to get some backfill for a seawall, is there a place you can just send the contractors to get some BAM material that would work instead of dirt? Like, hey, just go to this place at blah, blah. And yep. You see uh, Environmental Conservation Solutions in Apopka makes the bold and gold BAM. Um, but, you know, I, I am unaware of any other commercially available BAM that a company has put research into it and then manufactures it in the way that, ECS does in Apopka, um, but you could make your own BAM material up. You know, there's lots of research and studies out there that, that you could make your own, literally make your own and put it in there. So, but you could go buy a commercially available that is a proven technology. You could go buy it tomorrow if you wanted to. Yep. And I, I, think, I think the goal would be to get the engineers to be using that because as Chris has said, each application has a specific, you know, chemistry for how it lasts. But I think, again, the BAM is an example, David, to your point of the swales, of a paradigm shift of maintenance. We know that you're going to need to do it, but the question is when, and a lot of people don't want to do it because they don't know. So um, the studies, like the one the county did, which, by the way, kudos to Virginia, and Anthony, and Matt's not here. I love giving him praise when he's not here because he just said doesn't need to get any bigger. But um, <laughs> no, seriously, like I remember, you know, talking to Virginia about this because the state, and, and I give kudos to, to DEP for looking at their own rules. Um, the state had required only wood chips. That was the only requirement. And so we talked about upgrading septics and helping people do that. Well, we weren't really sure wood chips were the best solution. So Virginia, county staff, Anthony, Matt, uh, I guess private uh, commercial applications, Chris, their company worked together um, and now has given DEP some more information that shows otherwise. So kudos to, to everybody in, in that process. Um, and I, and I, just to echo that, like Brevard County is a leader in this space. So the Scottsmore Ditch Project is going to use a, a proven media, which is sand and iron enhanced filing, uh, iron filings. This will be the first time it's done that I'm aware of in the state here. Um, and they're looking at how's it going to work. Yeah. So we know it's going to work. We, we, we've seen it in the Midwest. They've used this BAM material for years and years and years. So uh, Brevard County really has led the way in this discussion and is really doing scientific analysis of what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. So kudos again to them. And I, you know, thank you for letting me be here. I'm going to stop and say thank you for letting me be here. I really appreciate it. I am available to answer questions. And if I don't know them, I'll get you plugged into the right person that does know them. Um, and I'm passionate about doing this stuff. I want the water to be better. So anything I can do to help you all in your efforts, your towns, cities, engineers, let us know. Um, there's a whole team of us, uh, not just at Ferguson, but everywhere that really want to help with the water. So I, again, I thank you all for the work you do. It's thankless work, quite frankly, probably most of the time, but thank you very much. Well, we'll thank you, Chris. Thank you for that. And Virginia, for the record, his presentation was 45 minutes. And <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. So let's do this uh, because we're almost at 11. Let's take a five minute break. Uh, David or uh, Brendan, you can queue up the uh, videos that we have um, and we'll go further into our agenda. So thank you. Five minutes.
Take our seats if we can. All right. Um, let's go ahead and uh, come back to the meeting. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue our agenda. Uh, the next thing we have uh, two project videos. Um, uh, Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. All right. So the first one here is the clam restoration project. Now this wasn't a sorrel funded project, but um, we work with the zoo on a lot of other projects and um, we wanted to highlight this. So it ties into some of our own clam restoration. Today we are working on uh, monitoring some clams that were placed by the Brevard Zoo in a restoration project. These sites have been laid out uh, both by the zoo and by, by UF and, and collaborators on this project. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of them. And they uh, uh, are looking today to find out how the clams are doing, what their survival rate is, and then how, how, how well they're growing. This project um, was brought to us by University of Florida. So Todd Osborne approached the zoo almost a year and a half ago and asked um, whether or not we would be interested in branching out into clam restoration, which we obviously said yes. And this is one of the first sites that they decided to come out and put here in Rivard County. And they put in some big clam beds just to see how the clams would do here. Any filter feeder has a role in, in the lagoon's ecology, right? And so we've been used to clear water in the past. That was a function of both the filter feeding community and the seagrasses that helped trap those particles. And so clams, just like oysters, are actively filtering water and they're removing particles. And so on one foot, the benefit of restoring clams, just like oysters, is improving water clarity. We, we, we put that under the umbrella of water quality, but turbidity is the problem, whether it comes from algae or from inorganic materials or organic particles, whatever the case may be, the amount of sunlight that gets to the bottom is the, is the critical issue for seagrass. Brevard County actually has the most riverfront out of all of the counties that border the lagoon. We have quite a few clam beds in here. They're all the way from Titusville all the way down to Mico. A lot of people don't know, but the Indian River Lagoon is not only the source of the, the clam industry in the state of Florida, the broodstock for the entire clam industry originated here. Um, the second thing is, is that in the in the 70s through the 90s, wild clam harvest in the lagoon was was world renowned. I mean, people came from all over the East Coast. Companies came to harvest. Fishermen came from everywhere to harvest here because we had tremendous clam populations. And unfortunately, since 2011, those populations have taken a gigantic dive. So broodstock are the animals that we're going to aid in reproduction in the laboratory. We collected mature adult organisms from the lagoon that had been present, and we can tell that by their age and their size, been present for a lot of these harmful algal blooms, and so we know they're very strong. Um, they're very hard to find. It took us two months to locate 39 clams. And you can't look at a clam and tell if it's a boy or a girl, so you just have to take them back to the lab and, and spawn them. So we call that our broodstock. That's, those are the, the parents of all the clams that we're planting today. Those 39 clams began the program, and those 39 clams produced about 45 million larval clams in our first run at the lab. The Save Our Indian River Lagoon program is working with many different entities in the community, whether that's government agencies or nonprofits. In the case of this project, we aren't funding it directly, but it is enhancing some of the other projects we do. So we're glad to work with the University of Florida and Brevard Zoo to help uh, alongside of these restoration projects and enhance what we're doing overall. So this is one of many sites around the lagoon uh, where clams have been able to be put out into the water and a lot of them are actually in front of homeowners property where the seed has been released and the clams are out there growing and as they grow they're filtering the water but this allows community engagement. So um, Brevard Zoo had this funding um, to do this project and it's a great opportunity for getting the community members involved. They 
get in the water, they get their feet wet, they are able to dig up in the mud and look at these creatures that otherwise no one gets to see. So if you want to volunteer or you live on the river and want to get involved, um, you can go to RestoreOurShores.org, the Volunteer tab, and you can actually sign up for any of our volunteer events if you want to come out and help us monitor. That would be great. Or if you live on the river, you can actually sign up to have a clam bed. Other ways citizens can get involved is they can go to lagoonloyal.com and find out ways they can reduce their excess nutrient pollution that's heading into the lagoon. There's many simple actions that they can take around their own home and in their everyday life that can help improve the lagoon. All right. Thank you, Brandon. I think we've got one more, right? Anyone... Anyone have any questions or comments on the clams? I can tell you what, am I the only one that saw those clams and was like, I remember those were so good. My grandpa and grandmother, we used to uh, harvest back in the day and they would make those. And I don't know, I just, my, my taste buds started watering. I don't know if it's close to lunchtime or whatever. No audio. Oh, Brandon, we've got us we muted. Haven't, yeah, I was just getting the video queued up. So. Am I still muted? I think you should oh. Uh, oh, sorry, the yeah, Zoom. You could unmute the. that they took yeah. to find those and that parented 45 million larval at the first run. Yeah. That's tremendous. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. I was, I was just um, saying how my taste buds were reminiscing on those photos of the clams. Um, I remember those. They, uh, they, were, they were good. And also I want to point out, because I love pointing out cameos, did anyone see a certain Virginia Barker was in that video there? Um, <laughs> If not, watch it again. She's in there. Sorry, Virginia, pointing you out. All right. Uh, thank you, Terry, for pointing out the audio wasn't working. Brandon, I think we're ready for the next one. Let's try this one. We are here building reef prisms, and this is actually an element that's a component of a living shoreline. We've used these in other parts of the state, but here it's going to be part of a living shoreline adjacent to a seawall over at McNabb Park. And these actually will provide, hopefully, artificial substrate for oysters to improve water quality and improve habitat. There's lots of different materials that can be used as a component of a living shoreline, but in the past a lot of those were made out of, or at least partially made out of plastic. We're trying to move away from plastics. We, knew, we know that microplastics in the environment and macroplastics, not a good thing. So we developed an alternative material that's actually using a jute material, which is the same material as natural fiber used in burlap, but this is a looser mesh, and we embed the jute in that cement, and that hardens it, basically, and then form that around something we call a prism. So it's a, a material that has lots of different types of forms that it could take. In this case, it's reef prisms, but the raw material is also being used in a panel form that can be used for oyster recruitment and restoration of oyster reefs that are offshore. Today we're out here at the McNabb Park Living Shoreline. We're installing our living shoreline here for the city of Cocoa Beach. Um, that shoreline consists of a few different items. We have mangrove planter boxes, oyster gabions, oyster prisms, and then we also have rhizolith islands. They're all going to support oyster growth, mangrove growth out here, as well as some grasses. Oyster reefs are one of those key items that are typically used to remove nutrients and pollutants from the Indian River Lagoon. It's said that one oyster can filter anywhere between 30 to 50 gallons of water per day. So as you can imagine, when we have thousands out here on our shoreline, that's a lot of water that's being filtered, a lot of nutrients and pollutants that are being removed from the water. Also, the mangroves are going to add a kind of a beautification aspect to our living shoreline area. Those mangroves also utilize the nutrients in the water as they're growing larger and larger. So they'll continue to get more nutrients and help clean the water that way as well. This is a very innovative project here at McNabb Park. We're in a little bit more recruitment limited area, meaning there's not quite as many baby oysters in this part of the lagoon, but we do believe that they have been here in the past. And so they're trying three different methods to bring oysters into these materials. A number of them are getting oyster spat settlement in an aquaculture facility. Some are having barriers placed around them and baby oysters will be released right into those barriers. And the third way is that we have some oysters that were grown in the lagoon and are a little bit of a larger size that we've moved here and are getting placed in the gabions. So we have older adult oysters and new baby oysters that are all gonna go onto this project. 
we're very excited to call this a plastic-free living shoreline, meaning that we don't have any type of plastic. Everything we're doing here is made out of um, either recycled materials or renewable materials or those that will not cause microplastics in the water. We're also implementing mangrove planter boxes, which we're very excited about. Um, it's kind of a Cocoa Beach original. We haven't seen these anywhere else before. Um, they're basically these boxes that we filled with oyster shell. We made them out of um, a wooden frame, wrapped that in some metal wire, and lined that with that jute material, and then we planted the mangroves in them to hopefully establish some type of mangrove growth along our seawall. Everything that we used to build those mangrove planter boxes, we bought at a local home improvement store. Um, so hopefully, you know, if this is a successful method, this is something that perhaps a homeowner could implement along their seawall or their property. This project is being done in conjunction with several other projects in the area, and just like those projects are working together to help save the Indian River Lagoon, we have a lot of community partners that are working together on this project. The city of Cocoa Beach is the lead on the project, but we also have involvement with the Save Our Indian River Lagoon program, the Department of Environmental Protection, St. John's River Water Management District, the National Estuary Program, and the Tourist Development Council, University of Florida, IFAS Sea Grant, Brevard Zoo, Marine Resources Council, and FIT, all working together on different aspects to support this project. I'm really interested in trying to find ways to enhance these shorelines, and developing a material like this in the form of these um, reprisms is a tool, but it only works if we have lots of willing bodies to help us make them. It's pretty labor-intensive, but it's something easily done by volunteers. And so it's really rewarding to see groups of people want to come out and make them. It's even more rewarding when we see those go into the water and even further when they start actually recruiting an environment of oysters and then they start filtering water and we've kind of now, you know, helped really the environment make a difference. I've been volunteering for these projects to help the Indian River Lagoon, specifically the Banana River, which is my backyard. It's, it's really great to see a group of people come together to, for projects such as this. It's a good community thing that's going to accomplish something. We've had our whole city come together to make this project possible. I mean, out here today, we have our fire department, we have our public works staff, we have our stormwater staff, we also had our water reclamation staff out here this morning, and a number of other um, departments have helped us. So I think getting as many hands in this as possible so that it's not just, you know, our project, that it's everybody's project, it belongs to the community. So hopefully we can make a big difference and filter some water. Hopefully we'll start to see some improvements there and the community will benefit from that. Community members can also get involved with projects like these. One way is to get involved with the building portions of the project through organizations like the Brevard Zoo's Restore Our Shores. If people don't want to get wet and dirty but want to get involved, they can go to lagoonloyal.com where they can find simple actions they can do around their home and their everyday lives to reduce the nutrient and pollution inputs to the Indian River Lagoon. All right. Is the mic unmuted, Brandon? Yeah. All right. Great. Um, thank you. Um, good videos. And I, I feel like I stole a little bit of the thunder, Kelsey. I'm sorry. I was asking about those boxes. I was so excited. But that's a, that's a really cool piece. And if that works, I hope to one day see a YouTube video of like it being created so people at home can go ahead and, and build them themselves because that's, that's really cool. It's really cool. Um, all right. Anyone have any other questions or comments on the videos? Okay, now we will move to the next portion of the agenda, um, our new business. And so the first item we have is our septic upgrade program retroactive payment requests. And I think Matt's going to give us a little bit of brief um, background on that. So take it away, Matt. And while they're getting that ready, we have uh, all the information was in the packet for this, as well as some options for a motion. I'll go ahead and um, read the, a little bit about it. So the title is the Septic Upgrade Program Retroactive Payment Request. And so the requested action is we gave the committee a couple of options to choose from on what we can recommend to the county commission on how to proceed with these. And so Matt's going to go through those options um, right now. Okay. So um, I'll start off by saying the septic upgrade program, which uh, has grown a lot in the past couple of years. Uh, we sent out 5,000 postcards to residents who are eligible for at least uh, eight 
from eight thousand to eighteen thousand dollars of reimbursement for these programs. Uh, big shout out to the Department of Health who has who has taken on a lot more applications than they've ever had, and uh, the contractors who are working uh, really hard to do these for us uh, and for the people and for the lagoon. Um, with that uh, expansion of the program, we've had people come forward uh, from the public who did not apply for this program, didn't maybe they uh, they weren't aware of the program before they got a postcard, or they heard from someone else uh, that there's this type of program going on, and they or their contractor maybe didn't tell them about this program, and they went ahead and installed one of these systems, um, uh, an advanced nitrogen reducing septic system and they are asking to be reimbursed just as if someone who did apply for the program uh, would get money uh, they're asking for reimbursement so our currently our rules for this septic upgrade reimbursement require that you apply for the program then you get approved by the by this by the county then you go ahead hire a contractor perform the work and then once the work has been inspected by the department of health uh, the property owner would apply for reimbursement, so they would send in the proof that they got a passing inspection, proof that they paid the contractor, uh, and, and just showing that the work was done. And then the SORL program reimburses them their um, their amount, their grant. So, so these retroactive payments for folks who did not apply for the program, they just installed this. Um, these folks are seeking, you know, some kind of reimbursement. So, some possible ways to approach this uh, going forward. Uh, we have three things we could do. The first, uh, or three things that we could consider doing. Uh, the first is that the COC recommend to the Board of County Commissioners uh, to authorize retro pay to homeowners who meet certain conditions. Uh, the, so these conditions would be. They're listed here. I, I, I hate slides with a lot of words, but here they are. Um, to break it down, so the upgrade must have been voluntary by the homeowner, so they might they must not have been required to put it in because um, they're not really doing it for the lagoon. Uh, the upgrade must follow all of our current program guidelines. Uh, they, they must have passed a final inspection. They need to have uh, no gaps in their maintenance or their permitting requirements. Um, it shall the pay should not exceed some of the costs that they've proved that they paid. Um, the work must have been completed after September first, twenty twenty, which was when we processed the very first one of these. So, really, when we instituted the program, and the work had to be completed before June of 2022, and that was the last time we sent out postcards. So everyone who would have qualified for some funding for this would have got uh, one of these postcards and known about the program. Uh, they also must load at least uh, 10 pounds of total nitrogen, which is estimated using our ARC Inlet nitrogen loading model. And uh, they and this retro pay will not exceed six thousand dollars so it'd be a flat six thousand dollars to folks um, who did this work and this six thousand dollars really represents the cost between a conventional septic system and the average cost of an advanced treatment septic system so you're looking at a twelve thousand dollars for a conventional system eighteen thousand dollars for an advanced system uh, this also equals the six thousand dollars also equals what we would pay someone who loaded uh, five pounds of nitrogen we would pay $1,200 based on our prorated uh, way of reimbursing folks. So they would get that $6,000 anyway. Um, so this, we currently have five folks who have reached out. Uh, so that would be a total fiscal impact of $30,000 to reimburse these folks retroactively. And uh, as one of the conditions we could proposed to the Board of County Commissioners is that these some of these retroactive payments do not exceed $100,000 without uh, further specific authorization uh, by the Commission. And the other two conditions for consideration would be to recommend to the Board that they, cons they consider specifying other conditions that the homeowners uh, seeking retroactive payments must meet, 
or recommend to the Board of County Commissioners that they reject these requests altogether for retroactive payment. So we wanted Terry? to leave it up to the committee here to decide which direction to take. So whether that's accepting all 10 of those mm -hmm. conditions, modifying some of those conditions, or whatever combination you guys could come up with, and then or just completely rejecting um, retroactive payments. Okay, so two, two things, just to be clear, this is a recommendation we're gonna be giving to the county commission for their approval. Second thing is we've got four minutes before our three hour limit. So is there a motion to extend? I don't wanna do it in the middle of our discussion. Well, we have this and then one more item. So I would- Public comment. And public, oh well, yeah, and public comment, which I have to, I would suggest we extend it for 30 minutes. I don't know if we'll take the entire time. Right, so is there a motion on the floor? I'll motion to extend the meeting for 30 minutes. Okay, is there a second? Okay, any discussion? Any public comment? I know they're like, no, we want to go. Um, okay, so we'll do a voting. Uh, all those in favor of extending the meeting for 30 minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, 30 minutes. So now uh, I know Stephanie and I think Courtney and then Charles. I had a question. The, the five home, homeowners who approached you, are they within the group that had received postcards? or they're outside of that group. They're, they're homeowners just throughout the county that have upgraded their systems, but they're not in the um, sweet spot areas for the Indian River Lagoon. So they are a mixture of both. Um, we do offer the grant to everyone in the county but it's based on their nitrogen loading. So someone who loads one pound to the lagoon is only eligible for $1,200. They're likely, they're not gonna put in an aerobic system and because of the nitrogen reduction. They may not be required to, or uh, they, they wouldn't have got a postcard. Um, we, so y yes and no, I guess. So my, I guess my question then is, so inside the 10 things that you're potentially recommending for this, there's not a specification that they can, they can have a prorated amount based upon, they either have to have the 120 or they don't, or the 1,000. They would get this flat $6,000 whether if, if they are reducing at least five pounds of, nutri of total nitrogen. But if they're not reducing that amount, then there's no, there's no provision in here for a proration. This is where the committee could discuss that to change. These were just suggested right. modifications. Right, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's my question. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the five homeowners that are currently requesting it all have exceeded that amount? Yes. Okay. Good question. So I would move to um, accept the 10 recommendations from that you all proposed rather than reading through all of them, those 10 recommendations and allow that this, those homeowners to apply for this, um, these funds. Okay, there, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, okay, so now we'll open it for discussion, Courtney. But with, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say I agree very much with this in the fact that what we don't want is for homeowners to feel that did the right thing to be penalized, you know, because they just didn't know. And I think they probably found out because the postcards went out and they went, wait a minute, I already did this. <laughs> um, so I, I, don't, I think it's a fair list of conditions you all put together, and I think it's a good idea. We don't want to penalize homeowners who were the first and they did the right thing before you know we had um, gotten to them and, and educated them about the options. So I think it's a good thing. So thank you. Okay, uh, Charles and then Susan. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the provisions are, are well stated. What I was curious about is that the cap, you said $100,000. So I presume you anticipate there's others 
who haven't been identified who have made these changes, and is that available through the DOH to people who have upgraded their, their uh, systems? So as far as us going out and seeking people who did these um, without knowledge of the program, we did not, I did not consider that. Um, so as like, I'm, your question is that we would, we would know, find people who had already done these within this time frame and then offer this to them? Well, I, I, I presume since you put a $100,000 cap, I think, on the budget that you were anticipating there's going to be other residents who say, hey, I did this as well, and I'd like to get some reimbursement. And yeah. I just don't know, how, how did you come up with $100,000? Was it just? Uh, um, Virginia came up with $100,000. Um, I think it's just to keep it from getting maybe out of control and but so Charles you know, I, Virginia and I talked about this yeah. last month last month and that was my concern is that if we do something opening up retroactively some sort of cap be that we don't end up with a bunch of people so she had said that was the number that she had thrown out but I don't think it was based on an, any idea on, on, on what would come back that value is based on what the county management can sign off on anything over hundred thousand dollars would need board approval And is there a way, though, of anticipating what that might be? Like, if you went back in the Department of Health records and say, well, geez, these new septic tanks that were installed in that time frame, they, they didn't get reimbursement, they didn't apply for it, but maybe they're going to be eligible just to kind of help guide what those numbers might be? It's, yes, that data exists and could be pulled up. Okay, uh, Susan, oh, sorry, Charles, you... Okay, Susan and then Kimberly. Charles asked one of the questions I was going to ask. Um, I agree with Stephanie and Courtney on their points on approving this. My question is, if we approve this, um, at what point will we cut it off? Like, would it be December this year for those it was, five people? Or The work had to be completed by June of 2022. So okay. they, they have to fall in that time frame for the work completed. So could somebody apply next week? Somebody could apply but indefinitely if the, as not, long if as the work, work was, was done, done already. By June. Okay, so yeah. there's no cutoff as long as we hit the hundred thousand hour cap, then okay. Kimberly. Is the six thousand dollar cap that flat rate, is that significantly less than anyone's proposed uh, reimbursement at this time up to that eighteen thousand? Um, we've had folks who have been eligible for Seven, eight, seven, eight thousand um, dollars. Who have applied for the program, done the work, you know, spent twenty thousand dollars on a septic system, and then gotten, you know, seven thousand dollars from us, you know, back as part of their prorated reimbursement. All right. My question was in specific to these five applications. Oh, so uh, all of these applications uh, would have been approved for. I want to say the lowest was around eleven thousand dollars, and the highest was probably, I believe, the eighteen thousand dollars. So then, that's five thousand dollars. That because they didn't know about the program in advance, that they're missing out on essentially. Yes. Well, not only known about in advance. This is, and, and Matt, help me if I'm wrong. We had we originally started out with a smaller area of septic upgrades, mm -hmm. and then so people that were outside that area did an upgrade on their own. And then now we've gone to a larger area. So it's not that they didn't know about it. It wasn't even offered in their area. Okay. So in other words, these are people that went, if I'm correct, Matt yep. and Terry. So, so these are people that it wasn't offered, but they were like, well, we're going to go ahead and do it. And now that we've chosen to expand the area, we're seeing if we can reimburse some of the work. I mean, it's already been done. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it has to do with more logistics of where they were located, not the timing. Correct. Or a mix of both, I guess. But Correct. And that's why that was going to be my question is, Matt, nowhere in here does it say that they're now within that expanded. No, none of the requirements say that they're within the expanded septic area. So I want to make sure that it says, because it just says if, if the work was completed between 
September and June, but it could be anywhere in the county if I'm reading the requirements right. Correct. So that would be my modification to approving it is that they now live within the expanded um, area that we're offering reimbursements. Hmm. Because I think the way it's read, it could be anywhere in the county. Well, it can be anywhere in the county, but it's based on the... the but, don't, but the postcards that we yeah. sent out now, the areas that we're giving reimbursements, those are only certain areas in the county, right? It's not everywhere in the county? It is everywhere in the county based on the nitrogen removal. Okay, based so, on the nitrogen removal. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. So then, so then based on that information that he just said in regard to it being countywide, those people would have been eligible for the greater amount if they had applied before doing the work? Yes. Well, we didn't offer it when they did the work. We were only offering it within a smaller area. No, it was offered countywide during the time of their work? No. No. Okay. no. So the countywide expansion didn't come until after they had done their work? Correct. Okay. Just want to clarify. Yeah, no, 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 Kimberly, no, it's good. It's a, it's okay. a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a mind, mind boggle. There's a, another caveat that, uh, that I, so I would support the way this is written. Um, for example, in Coco, after they did the design, there were six properties that they could not include in the sewer. So those then became eligible for the upgrades. So, you know, you are going to run into that sort of thing. And were those, was it done? Do you know those properties? Had those I know of at least done? one where they did go out. They did go out. Yeah, at okay. their own expense. One, yeah, the way it's written, it would. That's why I would argue not to change Up to it. that 100000 which I think is yeah. important to have um, that limit, <clears throat> um, which can be extended if it needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. They come back to us and we say, okay, there's a need to do that. Mm -hmm. We can recommend to the commission to do that. To raise the at amount. that time, yeah. But I think the hundred thousand cap allows us to control our spending, you know, and to make sure we we understand what what's being spent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, there's a motion on the floor. Is there any public comment? Okay. And now we'll take virtual public comment. Any of the attendees would like to speak on the motion on the floor? All right. Um, no virtual hands being virtually raised. We'll go ahead and uh, take a vote. All those in favor in recommending um, the um, motion or the requirements as they're listed, um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Passes unanimously. Um, great. Thank you, everybody. Okay. The last item on the agenda. Um, was going to be a discussion on communication expansion. And so I'll turn it over to Brandon. All right, so you guys have mentioned uh, at different meetings at, about the way we communicate and wanting to expand upon that. So we just wanted to go over a brief overview of what we're doing already and then some possibilities for the future so that you guys can give us direction on where you'd like us to go. Um, so one of the first things we started off with to communicate with the public was our dashboard where we show our progress. We've modified that over time, uh, added in more thermometers and our most recent modification, we've added some projected in so you can see the light blue bars show the amounts that are contracted but haven't been completed and where the dark blue shows the completed parts. So just to give a a better idea that, you know, for example, the nitrogen removal, while we might be at 127,000 pounds, we're actually contracted so far 929,000. So there's a lot that's underway. We've added in story maps, and those have also expanded with more and more as we get requests for different things. Uh, one of the last ones that was done was a uh, baffle box story map. People kept asking where baffle boxes were, so we mapped out all the baffle boxes in the county, both city and um, county ones, and so people can go see that. And then we just added in this week the algae bloom viewer tool and um, 
we uh, added in the lagoon overview map, the one that Becky had been working on. So that one is live now on our website. The social media, that's always been there from the beginning. So we put out posts on Facebook, on our YouTube. Now I had to use a shortened URL for YouTube because we don't have a custom URL yet. So this is my plug to sign in and subscribe on our YouTube because we're only 24 people away from being able to make our own oh. custom URL. So. Oh man, 24 oh. people out there, come yeah, on. We need 24 people to subscribe, to subscribe. Chris, Chris, hit that subscribe button, match it, match yeah. it. So then we can make our own custom URL. Uh, on our Instagram page as well, push stuff out through there at Save Our Lagoon. We do a lot of outreach events. We table at different festivals. We go talk to various groups, whether it's homeowners or you know, libraries, whoever you know, requests us to come out, city councils. We've been to many different groups and talked to them. We have a newsletter we just started up. So we mentioned that to you last month. Uh, we had 68 subscribers after mentioning it at uh, the meeting and we looked at the open rate, the nice thing about constant contact, we can track all these things. We're about 7% below the industry average on the open rate, but you know, not, nothing to be too concerned about. It's fairly new and hopefully as people get used to it, they'll open it a little more. Uh, we did have a higher than average click rate though. So they say 2% click rate, that's when someone clicks on one of the links in the email. So they went and viewed one of our videos or went to our website, something like that. And um, so just in the last month since we started that, we've now bumped up to 125 subscribers. Uh, the most we've gotten was through our social media posts, but we're also, uh, the second highest was through the QR code we showed in the meeting uh, last month. So our website also has availability to sign up there. Uh, we've put it in our email signatures as well, so people can sign up at the bottom of our emails, and we've gotten a few from that. Uh, sharing, we put a link we can track in the newsletter if someone shares it. And then uh, we've also included it in our story map. So, And in case you haven't signed up, we'll leave that up there. But uh, you can go onto our website under Save Our Lagoon. It's on the home page, and it's also underneath our story map page. And you can use that QR code now if you need. And give that one more second. There's like 10 more signups right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we also, as mentioned, uh, Matt was talking about our HAB uh, viewer tool. We are starting a sign up there where people can go and get notices whenever we have a new report out. So they get a weekly email saying there's a new HAB report. And uh, we're working on the format, whether they'll be directed to a story map or whether they'll just have the information included in an email itself. Um, so working on what's the easiest time-wise to get that out. And so that's also on our story map page. If you go to the HAB viewer, there's a link on there to sign up for that notification. And we also have our Lagoon Loyal program. So all the ones we've mentioned to you previously are sort of the free ways we can get information out there. Um, Lagoon Loyal is one of the programs that we have decided to pay for. You, know, you guys decided to put money towards that. Now we work with our stormwater utility and they are doing, they fund part of it and then we fund the fertilizer and the septic portion of that. So they fund all the other info out there that we put up. And so they've done a lot of various things. So they have the fertilizer signs that we put up in the retail locations. They have the middles Google ads that they put out there, so they'll have different topics on those that people can click on. There's also Facebook ads that they put out, as you'll see on the far right. And they developed a flyer that goes out to realtors to educate people about septic. There's also a septic magnet seen on the right there. That one is given to all the septic companies, so they can hopefully give those out when they go to a service call and inform people what they need to do on their um, septic tanks to keep them healthy. We've done the septic postcards as well to let people know about the upgrade program. And we are getting ready to put out some yard signs. These will go in some of those septic upgrade 
areas and just letting people know that this is going on and get neighbors talking about, you know, what is this, how can I get involved? And we, you know, saw that in Sunnyland as they started to promote it, more and more people there started wanting to get their own yards done. So we're hoping this will help promote that even faster. And while we don't have funding to put up signs at our regular projects because it's not fertilizer or septic related, um, we don't necessarily have the funds to do it at every project. We have had some of the cities put us on there when they have signage up there. So this is an example of the one at the Osprey wastewater facility that they're doing the upgrade. So there's been discussion that we would, you know, like to do that. That could be something that would be incorporated into the contracts, perhaps, you know, either requiring the entity that uh, is doing the project to fund that, or we can put funding towards that ourselves, get so many signs that would be recycled and reused at the different projects. Um, but these are the things that you know, the committee would have to recommend and we'd have to incorporate in next year's plan. So some other ideas that have been mentioned either at the meetings or just brought up in general or utilized in some of our uh, fertilizer and septic outreach. So there's boosting social media posts, Google ads, inserts in the utility bills, uh, newspaper ads, mailers such as you know Valpac, Saving Safari, or we can make our own postcard that goes out, uh, bus wraps, billboards, radio ads, TV and streaming ads, and uh, promotional items. So those are just a list of some things. I'm sure you know you might think of some others, but um, as far as funding goes, that would be up to you guys to recommend how much we would fund for something like that. Looking at various campaigns, they can vary anywhere from you know, maybe a $500 ad that you're putting out on um, online. On a, you know, we've done some through Space Fish and, like I said, those Google ads as well. So you might look at $500 a month there. There are some, you know, more expensive ones. It'll be three to five thousand. Some of those mailers, like the Valpac little coupons you get are, you know, be about $3,800, I think I looked at, to mail out to the county per month. So when we looked at comparing our budgets, so $50,000 is what we've currently budgeted for our fertilizer campaign, and another, and 25 is what's budgeted for the septic campaign. And when you look at those, that means we're spending one penny for every $108 of project that we're doing. And with the 50000 and then, you know, double that for the $25,000. Is that budget annually, Brandon? That's an annual budget, yeah. Annually, okay. Uh, yeah, so that gives you sort of that, you know, cost evaluation so you can interpret that. One other thing to keep in mind, um, as we get closer to renewing the... Uh, sales tax, or if we talk about renewing the sales tax, we have to be careful what kind of information we do put out there. So there was an amendment that was done to House Bill 921, which prohibits the use of public funds for a political advertisement, basically telling someone how they should vote on an issue. So that's always been in place. They added some language to that. So their new section on it prohibits the use of public funds for any other communication sent to electors concerning an issue or referendum. Um, irrespective of whether the communication is limited to factual information or advocates for the passage or defeat of the issue. So even if it doesn't say vote yes or no for this, just factual information could be construed as violating this bill. Um, there are a few allowed activities, so reporting on official actions of the local government. So when we're saying, you know, we finished this project, we started this project, those things mm -hmm. would be just fine. Um, and as long as, you know, it's done in an impartial manner, posting factual information on our government website or in printed materials. So again, just promoting the facts of the pro program itself and hosting and providing information at a public forum. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, if whatever recommendations you make, you know, some of those things could be limited doing, you know, mail outs or flyers and things in the future. Now, real quick question, and then Stephanie and Courtney. But that it said that language. Brandon said a referendum. That's not past referendums. No, that would be if so. We could report, something that's going. We could to report on all we wanted on what's happening. As far we as just, I'm we just aware, yeah. Would be careful or want to be careful mentioning any future 
-hmm. referendums. Once it comes up for a vote again, yeah. Yes. If it comes up for a vote again. If it comes up yeah. for a vote, yeah. Okay, great. All right, uh, Stephanie. One of the things that I was thinking about, we've had several municipalities that we're improving their um, systems. And I think it would be valuable to, for those municipalities in their utilities to send out something that says, you know, sorrel funds were used to upgrade the system, you know, in your municipality. Mm -hmm. And again, that's... That's an idea, I think, in the utility mailer that... Right, you exactly. About, yeah. To get, you know, West Melbourne, for example, um, Cocoa Beach, and some of those that are that are coming up that we've actually invested money in improving their systems and so to let their residents know sorrel funds were used to improve mm -hmm. the system that you're paying for. Mm -hmm. I agree. Courtney and then I've got something. I'm gonna can jump in. You, can you go back to that slide where it has the options? Yeah. So so I think that we should provide a budget for some of these things, particularly social media boosts. I mean, that is like a big bang for such a little buck. And all of our videos, being able to push that out to the larger community. I mean, I know countywide you're looking at a $400, you know, boost for something pretty big. But, I mean, what a, it's so worth it because that's a very easy way to communicate with people. And then get people to go to the Facebook page and, and promote the Facebook page itself. Um, the other thing is I would definitely ask the utilities to provide an insert. I totally agree with, with um, what you just said. And then the, the bus wraps, so easy to do. And, and I know they're a lot more expensive than wrapping my public works trucks, but, um, but that is another way that it's, it's very visible. And having our logo, Save Our Lagoon, you know, um, and all the information, like not a huge amount of information, but just having that out there in front of people is a big deal too. But I do think we do need to ask the commission to look again at the education piece, especially with fertilizer um, and, and bring as a commit, commit, committee, discuss that in the new plan update coming up to see if they're willing to increase that budget for, to increase fertilizer education with radio ads and all the other stuff we had originally planned to do. I totally understand what their point was and that we needed to do more projects, but I think we're kind of past that. We've got so many, you know, on the ground projects going on now. And I think, you know, we really need, it's just like Sunnyland, you know, the video that you all did with their, um, with their event, you know, the ending was, you know, it's not just government that's going to solve these problems. It's going to be the property owners and people who live here. And if we don't get that message out that they need to, you know, there has to be some behavioral changes, you know, we're never going to get them to change. And, and we are not, the government and this lagoon tax is not the only answer. And so I think we need to look at asking the commission to relook at that educational campaign in the future, but I, I agree we should put a budget to some of these items. And so I, what, what I was thinking and what, what I would recommend is that um, we take a look at that list and each of us um, over the next month write down our ideas, whether it's bus wraps, whether it's Google ads. I agree, we, you know, we should look at a budget, but I think we should spend the next month, go ahead and gather our own feelings, write them down, send them to Virginia or Brandon, um, I also wanted to reach out to some local organizations like the Space Coast AAF, American Advertising, Advertising Federation, see how many other community organizations we can get involved. Um, but I do think it, it, it would be good to look at this. So I would recommend that, that we don't do an action today, but we take a look at that list, um, write some stuff down, and bring this topic back for discussion next month. I agree. Perfect. Does that sound good? Kimberly, please. Um, on the uh, fiscal year of the quarter report, the projected monies, and please correct me if I'm reading this wrong, are 625000 and actual to date is 236000 So are those funds that are already set aside and allotted for fertilizer education that could be used for some of these 
programs or some of these advertising options? I think the 625 is total for, total for the, for the whole, whole project years. plan. Yeah. So for yeah. all 10 years. We've right. So but if you look, the uh, numbers decreased significantly and the first year reported is 120,000 and then and that was in 2019. And then for 2022, it's less than 20,000. So is there funds already allotted that could be used to do this or is that set aside for a different purpose? I believe in 2020, the, we had a different funding level for the fertilizer education and the commission had decreased that because they had a, a concern that we needed to get more hard projects on the ground started. Okay. So, um, so they decreased that number, which is why you see the amount of spent each year decrease. So if we, had go, if we go back to them and say we need to up that budget, you'll see that yearly budget increase. Okay. Yeah. So the 625, that Just number is? for the entire is... Lagoon plan period, yeah. For, okay. And again, though, the cumulative actuals are only 236. Correct. So That's that correct. would still leave several hundred thousand dollars. Do we still need to increase the money for, and I'm all for fertilizer education, by the way, is why I'm asking, because yeah, the more be, money we can we'll, use for that, the better. We'll be at like a 46,000-ish a year if we keep the current budget. But okay. if we go back to the previous budget, we'd be at 120,000 a year. Okay. So, so and that's and what the ask is for. How many for recognizes these? the fertilizer education? Have you anybody seen it? Exactly. <laughs> I have yeah. some just because I had to research it. And yeah. again, I'm on the cohort for the IFIS board yeah. in the county fertilizer education campaign. And they have a lot of buy ins on their advertisement that they're already putting together for 2023. Um, so whether it's idea. not that I don't want to ask for more funds, I definitely uh, recommend and would uh, support that. Um, but just there's a lot of options there that I'll bring back next yeah, month, please. like Ben suggested. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, David. I, I think this is so unbelievably important what you're doing, Brendan, with this work. Um, I think in general people either don't know that I talk to. I talk to a lot of younger people too, and mm -hmm. if they don't know about the program. Or if they do know about the program, it's not doing anything. It's not fixing the lagoon. Right. It's going into somebody's buddy's pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much misinformation. Nobody has any clue about the scope and magnitude of the civil infrastructure changes that this is funding that is, you know, changing the lagoon. Um, so I, I think this is super important. I don't know how we can do it. It's a very modest budget that you're doing as a percentage of spend. I mean, unbelievably, nobody in business would ever think of spending so little. Um, but what about just, I mean, and if I can pay for it, I'll pay for bumper stickers, like 5,000 or 10,000 bumper stickers that have your QR code and a QR code that just takes you to something that gives you all the other stuff. You know I mean? Like, so you can just have one QR code on a bumper sticker with our logo, I mean, uh, that we could spread around. Um, I, I, it, if I'm allowed to pay for it, I'll pay for 5,000 right now. I mean, well, done. I, I, I think as a private citizen, you're able to do any sort of bumper. I've seen some crazy bumper stickers. You can do any bumper sticker you want. <laughs> I made but some I think, about I you. That's a great idea. I think let's bring it back next yeah. month um, okay. for the discussion. If I could just Please. respond to that. Actually, when uh, Courtney mentioned the bus wraps, I thought, oh, that'd be a great place for a huge QR code. But then mom of several teen drivers, I automatically yeah. went to yeah. promoting using your phone mm -hmm. while driving. So I'm not discounting your idea, but mm -hmm. maybe like rework it a little I before next month. I think it's a big place. That's such a good point. A big, I didn't even think yeah. of that. place for Matt's face. Big Matt's face. Face on a bus, uh, or his cat. Only use it at stop Picture points. of Matt's cat. Okay, so we've got we've got one we've got one minute left in our thirty. Can we get a motion to extend? I think just ten minutes would work. Anyone? Motion, motion to extend. Motion to extend. Okay, a second. Okay, all those in our oh, discussion. Uh, okay, uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. And opposed. <laughs> okay, now we'll go to Dr. Windsor. We need an extension to hear Dr. Windsor. He had his hand raised. Go ahead, Dr. Windsor, please. You say, Dr. Windsor, what, you can't what, hear me? What is that? No? He's, He's saying he can't hear us. Oh, uh, yeah. For some reason, our audio dropped out. It says join audio. So, all right. Is that what he's saying? I, I think so. Dr. Windsor? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why our audio dropped out. We should have it back now. Dr. Windsor? Can you hear us now? We can't. Okay, we can't hear you. Hold on, Dr. Windsor, we can't hear you. Hold on one second, we can't hear you. He's muted. Yeah, it looks like we dropped on you. Try now, Dr. Windsor. He's muted. Yep. Yep. 
I have been trying to listen to you for probably 10 minutes and I have been trying to get your attention and we couldn't hear anything. Um, anyway, I don't think anything important happened in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, I just think you should know, uh, and I wasn't going to say anything because I still got COVID fog in my brain, but this whole meeting, uh, it's been very difficult on uh, listening to people talk. As soon as you drift a little bit away from your microphone, you turn your head to the side or whatever, you guys cut out. And I suspect that's only for the Zoom people. I suspect that doesn't affect the television audience. But it's been very disruptive, and I hate Zoom meetings. And I look forward to seeing you guys in person next month. Goodbye. <laughs> Dr. Windsor, thank you very much. I hope your uh, recovery, COVID recovery goes well. Um, and thank you for letting us know. Yes, uh, there, there are pitfalls for technology. Um, but, but I will say it does allow you to join the meeting, which uh, I always value your input. So thank you. Okay, um, so let's go ahead. Uh, anyone else have anything? Oh, you didn't miss anything, Dr. Windsor. I think I talked for nine of those ten minutes. So really, it's, it's, you're good. Um, any other comments? All right, so let's go ahead and go to general public comment. I have two cards, but I don't see Clint here, so he's uh, gone. Uh, Clint, I'm sure you'll call me later. Uh, Steve, I'll go ahead and have Steve speak from Sunnyland. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm Steve Hancock from Sunnyland. Um, you probably met me before. Um, just wanted to update you on a couple of things and also come to you, I guess, with an appeal for help. Uh, first of all, on the septic, um, the septic upgrades, we're just getting more and more tanks in the ground. Um, my next door neighbor is getting his this week. Um, I do feel like we're going to have to get to some kind of a carrot and stick approach, though, because it's still just too easy to, you know, ignore that. And I'm afraid that our septic contractor tells us occasionally they'll go out and do a job, and they open up the old tank, and it's empty. So basically, everything is just going straight into the water table and straight out. Well, um, anyway. Um, I feel like it's really going to be important that we get to inspections. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something, you know, monitoring the existing tanks. And people actually see that as a little bit of a disadvantage to participating in this program because, you know, now I'm signed up. I've got to have my I've got to have my ATU unit inspected supposedly twice a year. Um, which back by the way, I actually had my unit inspected a few weeks ago by some experts because Fuji Clean Corporate sent people from Japan out to Sunnyland. Matthew was there. It was really, it was really pretty interesting. Um, you know, we think of the lagoon as a special place, which of course it is, but this is actually a global problem of estuaries and, you know, we're not the only place that have, you know, people living near the water. And um, the Fuji Clean people were showing like the, you know, they're, very, they're serious about this as a, as a worldwide market, an opportunity, frankly, a business opportunity to sell their technology, which, you know, of course, they claim is the best, and, you know, it, it seems to be pretty good from what, you know, from what you hear from a lot of people. Um, so anyway, that's what's going on with, the, with Septic. Uh, we also had a very interesting meeting this week um, at a development called Harbor East, which is a canal front community just south of Melbourne Beach. Uh, we were referred to them by Dr. E by that, to that group by Dr. Ebel. Um, they actually do uh, a self-initiated, I guess you would say, dredging in there. They have a, um, a canal front owners association, uh, voluntary, just like their property owners association, but instead of just being social, this other association is like, okay, this is for the betterment and maintenance of the canals. Um, um, what's interesting there is they actually dredge their canals every 10 years, but it's only like whoever can pay for it. So they, 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 raise, they raise, I think he said they raise about $30,000 for mobilization to, um, uh, to bring the contractor in, and then, every, and then the contractor makes individual deals with all the individual owners. And then they have like a couple of vacant lots, and they use those for the spoil sites. Unfortunately, you know, while we up there, that, that sounded fantastic. It's, it's not going to work for, can I have three more minutes? I can't, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, Please. well, unfortunately, that's not going to work for Sunnyland. We've got about three times the area. Uh, we have other technical issues. So that brings us to what, what, what I'm really here for today, and that is we want to do 
we want to do an application to get uh, Sunnyland, dredging Sunnyland canals uh, into the prioritization. I was hoping to speak to Walker Dawson. Now I know why my last email to him bounced. Um, who is, I guess my question is, who is Walker Dawson's replacement? Who can we work with? You know, because there's things in this application we don't know how to answer, and we've got a limited number, limited amount of time to answer them. Um, so I don't, know if, I don't know if I can talk to somebody after the meeting. Uh, we could use some help with that. Um, I guess then the only other comment is we are just very, we're very interested in the um, uh, the seawall planting um, and the and the clams in particular. Well, I think there might be a lot of opportunities for that in the Sunnyland area. Anyway, thanks very much, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sure Virginia. Or Terry or the county staff can help you with any any not just you but anybody who has application questions. Please reach out to the county; um, they'll help you get those taken care of. Um, that awesome. Okay, good stuff. Oh, and real quick on marketing. Do you guys notice that guy had a super clam T-shirt? I want a super clam yeah. T-shirt. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you, Steve, uh, for that. And and uh, real quick, Terry, uh, Virginia, if you're listening, can we maybe have that canal? Uh, owners front maybe have them come and speak at a meeting or something I think that's interesting that smaller organizations that maybe cannot afford or, or maybe aren't big enough to have somebody come in and dredge if there's an organization that can help them we can reach out and ask them yeah crowd crowdfund or crowdsource dredging um, crowdsource dredging.com I'm gonna buy that David buy that right now and uh, we'll make millions okay um, any other public comment all right. Okay. So we've got four minutes, and I know Courtney had something she wanted to say, or two yeah, things. So things. Courtney, go ahead, and then we'll take other comment from the uh, committee. All right. Well, I did want to pass, you know, these out. This is, um, as some of you know. David. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you got COVID. Don't want to put my mouth. <laughs> so some of you know that um, I was I received an ethics complaint violation for um, voting or abstaining on a vote for the last year's or this past year's um, update to the plan and um, largely because one of the projects was in my city. Um, I've always said that I don't, um, that I am exempt from um, that and I, the, that portion of the law it, and it's very clear in the statute that government employees are exempt from that portion of the ethics law. And that I never really had to abstain on any project that I voted on just because my city is one of the receiving um, uh, cities. But um, I did get an ethics complaint um, because I turned in a form late. I just wanted to let you know that um, the ethics commission dismissed that complaint. They called me to let me know that. And then I was getting ready to send off a letter just to get a formal determination from them, even though it's very clear in the statute that I, I don't have a a conflict and um, right as I was getting ready to send off that letter I got their um, full you know determination and that's very clear they go through the whole statute and talk about how um, since I am employed by a government agency I'm exempt from that um, law I do not have a voting conflict I never have and that because I did not have a voting conflict in the first place turning in a form late was irrelevant so I just want to let everybody know that and for the record and hopefully resolve some of the concerns among the community that with some of the, you know, um, editorials in the Florida today that I just, um, you know, that there is nobody up here, um, particularly me, that has a voting conflict. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about was I wanted to share uh, an item that my city is getting ready to launch, and I thought you all would be interested in that. This is just copies of the flyer. The flyers are being, or brochures are being, um, sorry, <laughs> are being, um, Printed right now, and we will be um, launching this program in September with a pilot canal. The project has been um, recommended by the TDC for funding, and that'll go to the um, county commission for grant funding to launch the pilot program. And basically, what it does is it um, asks the residents to do a fertilizer pledge, a pet pledge, um, participate in a plant grant, which that, that's what we call it, where they um, move their grass away from their seawall and plant native vegetation, hopefully maybe even a swale, um, and then also um, put in uh, aeration systems through the canal. And so we are getting ready to go bid for the aeration company. 
um, at the end of this month. I'm hoping Clint will respond to that bid. Um, we've been in lots of discussions with him, and so we'll, we're very excited about this program. So that'll be launched pretty soon. Um, and then because of the changes we've made in the city of Satellite Beaches staffing, um, we created a, we are, because of those changes, we've been able to do these types of programs. And what we did was we created a department called Planning and Sustainability. Um, I have a new department head, um, Thea Baker, who is our new director. She's got a master's and degree in sustainability. She's wicked smart and very, very good, um, very creative. So she's been leading this charge along with my new stormwater manager, um, Kate Helms, and she's she's also wicked smart. They're also very expensive, but um, <laughs> but they the, this new department will be housing the um, our environmental coordinator, which many of you know, Nick Sanzoni, and then our city biologist Jenny White, as well as a chief planner, which I'll be hiring in in October. Um, the reason why we're doing that is putting planning and sustainability together is because of um, combining our resiliency, um, city redevelopment, and uh, sustainability all in one um, department. And low impact design, uh, stormwater design will be a large part of that effort. Um, and then because I'm so busy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be um, just announcing that in February will be the end of my term and I will be um, ending my term. So, um, or ending, you know, not renewing my term. Um, so I'll be, I sent that notice off to the County Commission as well as the Space Coast League of Cities. I was appointed by the Space Coast League of Cities. Um, so in that letter to them, I did recommend strongly that they move up Todd Swingle, who is currently my alternate. Todd has been the alternate for the finance um, position since day one. We've been on this committee since it started. Um, I'm pretty sure he's well equipped to take over the voting um, aspects of this of his um, position and uh, and then that would make uh, basically the county commission would have to um, approve a new alternate for that position so I'm pretty sure that um, I can't say for sure but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be at the meeting with the league and hopefully they'll they'll do that so and the only reason why is largely because like last meeting I missed a meeting because I have a state emergency response commission uh, meeting, which I was appointed to by the governor, and um, it, that is very important commission to me. And I'm, I have that; it conflicts with these meetings every three months. So that's another issue. So I'm just getting really busy at the city, I'm busy with the, some of my state um, commitments, and um, I do want to, because of my background in urban and regional planning, really start advocating for the growth, sustainability development side of lagoon restoration that we need to address at some point and I can't really do that being on this committee so all right thank you Courtney can, Charles. I, can I just say one thing I think this adopted canal is the only one in the country if not the first one well we did there's some um, they, they do it differently but we got the idea from another city because mm -hmm. I always tell my council when you're in government you'd never do things first mm -hmm. it's always better to be second um, so we took um, we took the idea of other people but the but what we're doing is a lot different yeah. because of the type of system that we have so it, it's 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 different but the names are kind of the same and the idea is the same and mm -hmm. it's really there to involve homeowners very similar to Sunnyland I mean they were kind of an inspiration for a lot of the the ideas that we we came up with for this and then mostly thank you for your service on this board here for those six years it's been oh, she's not done yet let's I let, know, let's thank her, let's let's thank her down the road we're all gonna uh, i thought it was november and then virginia reminded me and so did Vinny that nope nope you're, you're stuck until february and i was like okay all right so for that adapt a canal just real quick for those at home satellitebeach.org adapt a canal for those that don't have the handout satellitebeach.org slash adapt a canal okay I'm sorry, adapt. adopt, not adapt. <laughs> well, you can adapt the canal too. You can put the, the buckets or the, the boxes that we're talking about. Okay, uh, it, we're, we're already over, but I think we're done. If the only, do you have something, Lorraine? Okay. Well, I mean, I had, a, I had a similar ethics complaint filed against me with a similar response. I also had a FOIA request, my financial disclosures, and I hope, Bob, that you're satisfied but I have no financial interests <laughs> other than the home that I own and other than being a resident of this great county. Okay. Kimberly? There's an international shortage of fertilizer, so while some of us are very excited about this fact, um, 
There, it is plaguing a lot of farmers and a lot of industry professionals, um, but it's also opened a huge uh, opportunity for organic um, fertilizer, uh, different organic matters in general, and including cow waste, which also is a huge methane and carbon emitting factor. Um, so hopefully this is actually a good opportunity uh, to move for sustainable and more organic uh, and natural opportunities in the fertilizer industry. So. Like compost, yeah, I love it, yeah. love it. And, and I do feel for those that are affected financially in the industry, but it was time for them to move on anyway, so. <laughs> David, you got like yeah, 10 I, seconds. Okay, I just had a, a, a thought like muck, right? Is there something, and I know we've really explored muck, but is there something we can be doing with muck that it has some value? Like somebody mentioned to me, could you, uh, fertilizer's a thing, but it's got too much metals or whatever. What about worms? Can, it, can worms process muck? Can we get worms to biologically process it to, you know, turn it into something less harmful, et cetera? I want to throw it out for the environmental guys. And Courtney, it's been amazing uh, to serve with you. Um, and I'll be sorry to see you going. And I am sorry to see uh, what looks like political bullshit to me entering um, something that, having brought here by John Byron, he'd be very disappointed to see it's taking place. Yeah. Well, again, Courtney's committee. not done yet, so we'll thank her. We'll thank her after. All right. Um, anyone else? All right. Thank you, everybody. We will see you all in September. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.